Born in a triple army hospital, which, which in those days was located on the, at a military base in Hawaii, Schofield Barracks, and we lived in a little, very small hick town, Halaiva, which if you don't know means uh, house of little bird, or house of the east sun, or something like that. Typical Hawaiian uh, blow smoke at you. And what, what year was that? I was born in 1927. And what month and day? December 6th, one day before the thing, you know, only a few years later. Yeah. And, and what was it like being raised in Hawaii in a military town? Oh, boy. Well, let, let me just go back. My mother's Hawaiian, 100%, and her name is Holly Eva. And I, I don't know if the town's named after her or she's named after the town, but it goes way back. She was a very gentle very sweet, very small, unlike most Hawaiians, very small. And of course, my memory is, uh, may betray me, but as I recall, she was quite beautiful. Uh, my dad was a regular army corporal at that time, soon to be sergeant. He was a hard ass NCO that you didn't mess around with. And it was an interesting combination of her sweetness and gentleness and him being the tough guy. Um, he was from New York City. He grew up in the, what they call Hell's Kitchen. And I think that probably made him so tough. Because um, he was. I mean, he was, although he, he never took that toughness out on us physically. Well, one time he did. He smacked me one time. I'll never forget that one. <laughs> uh, and, but he had this uh, disciplined attitude. You know, structure and discipline is what makes a soldier. And so I'm growing up in that atmosphere. And of course, I'm surrounded constantly uh, by regular army folks that, uh, even at peacetime, were still very, um, I, don't know, I don't want to overwork the word structured, but organized and, and purposeful. And these principles of the, the value system of the army was embedded in all of us. I mean, I would no more think about being a coward than fly. <laughs> But not because I was brave, but because I was afraid of my father. <laughs> and uh, so some of the stuff we did, and the same with my sister and my brother, they, they all wound up being in the military too, so. And you were the eldest or the youngest? Or? I was youngest. And uh, the, shortly after I was born, my mother died. And uh, so that kind of, that in World War One, World War Two, excuse me, splintered the family. We, we were never together again, really. But well, tell me, what was it like? Now, you were, since your mother died shortly after you were born, you didn't have a personal experience with her. What was it like to the, with the father who was military and you were ready to go around? And you just obviously didn't spend all your time in Hawaii. No, I did not. They, we had kind of an extended, well, not kind of an extended family. In Hawaii, if you live in kind of a little village atmosphere, the kids might eat at your house or your next door neighbor's house or, you know, and your next door neighbor might do your laundry. And, so when it comes to a crisis situation like that, the military has this great custom of hovering over the family. And uh, the Hawaiian custom is even stronger. They really care much aloha. We say, you've heard the phrase aloha. Well, actually, the phrase is aloha nui loa. And that means much love, or that you are much loved. And so they take you in, and they become your parents. And I really don't remember being deprived until much later in my life. 
Uh, my dad, he never got over it. He never got over it. I tell you the truth, I, my, my father probably, uh, he married beyond himself because my mother was such a saint. And he turned to his military career as his solace. And um, we didn't see much of him, to tell you the truth. Like the other day, I was down in Monterey, CEO of Monterey. My dad had been the sergeant major there for a while. Went back to our old quarters. And you talk about walking in ghost land. <laughs> that was really, and of course, all these memories just well up in you. I have learned <clears throat> the hard way that it's better to control my emotions and uh, not, not contain them completely, but just control it. Because if you yield, you know, I mean, your heart's on your sleeve all the time. Fortunately, my, my, my wife has uh, been very, very good about making sure that my emotions are taken care of. That's great. And you have, uh, you said you were the youngest. Uh, how many children were there in the family? I had an older brother. He was killed in uh, the Battle of the Bulge. He was a young paratrooper lieutenant. My sister was an Army nurse, <coughs> and uh, she uh, wound up in a mental institution because she had her depression from seeing all the carnage of the um, the battlefield, you know. Where did she serve? She served in Europe. And, uh, but Jean, uh, how should I say it? Jean was frail. I think she was more affected by the death of my mother. Yeah. And I don't want to portray myself as being some deprived person, or were they, you know, because they were very strong. But you deal with your sadness the only way you know how. And how the hell can you be sad when your mother dies you're that young? You just know something's missing, you know. I miss the gingerbread. <laughs> well, when, when you're, uh, what are you, some of the memorable experiences as a kid growing up in school or bases? What was some of the things that you remember? Oh, that's, good. that's an interesting question. Well, my, one vivid memory I have is <clears throat> there's a, uh, a beach. Well, you know, it. it's, it's, it's uh, North Shore you know, where the big surfing is. Well, off season, it's, it's a lot quieter. <laughs> so I can remember, remember my mother and father running down the beach holding hands and diving into the surf. My mom was a real first-rate surfer, you know? And, and my sister and I and my brother would sit there on the, on the sand and you'd be you know, cheering them on. And that was a big thrill. That's one memory. Go ahead, you want to? You might cut it off. Huh? The other memory is uh, Sundays in a regular army, the families would always go back to the unit where their father was to the mess hall, and they would always serve cold cuts and potato salad and, you know, all that stuff. Big spread, you know, and the, and the cooks would lay the cold cuts out so neat and tidy. And, I, and as long as I remember, I never had a Sunday, just a Sunday dinner. <laughs> oh, except on, you know, Thanksgiving and, and Christmas, we'd have turkey. You know, but but uh, there were these wonderful customs of growing up. There was a protective society. And yet, boy, I'll tell you, you step over the line and do something dishonest, lack of duty, uh, lack of fidelity, you're finished. And it's still, just a little bit. not so much because, you, you know, as well as I do, there's a lot of chicanery going on in the military. Um, the other thing is, soldiers in those days and families did not whine about what happened to them. You just did what was right. You read the biographies of these old timers and you see they all were dead, backbones of steel. You know? And of course, I'm growing up in this situation. <laughs> what am I supposed to be? I'm unlike them? No, I had to be just like them. My father, in some way, was a big hero, but I had other, had other, other heroes. I'll tell you a quick anecdote, a, a good example. My father's commanding officer was a full colonel. Now, remember, my dad was barely a staff sergeant for this time. Maybe, maybe he was a tech, I don't know. Anyway, the guy, and I won't mention his name, uh, uh, was a, a real drunk. And he came in on a Monday morning from one of his toots, and he had vomited it all over his beautiful uniform, and he was hungover, and he was, he was just disheveled. And so Dad came home, and I was surprised to see my dad at home. But you know, yes, it's you know after seven o'clock your dad's at duty. What well, it must have been about nine o'clock, and he ran some cold water in the bathtub and put some ice in there and dumped this girl in there and sobered him up. You know, my mother's washing his clothes. You know, and ironing it. And by about one o'clock, the guy was ready for duty, you know? Well, can you imagine that happening in the modern army? No way. <laughs> no way. So when you see that as a little kid, it makes an indelible impression on you. 
And one of the reasons that I, I suppose that uh, I become kind of a hard ass to everybody is I just don't believe in being weak, you know. And so if somebody's weak or somebody exaggerates around me, I, I don't want to be around it. Before I would attack, but now I just don't want to be around it. Well, when you went, you mentioned you had some uh, people that you uh, admired and emulated and uh, kind of father figures for you. Mm -hmm. um, can you mention some of those situations? Yeah, there was one guy, it was in the 11th Airborne, it was the 511th Parachute Infantry, which is the most elite parachute regiment, period, okay? And for me to get into that was just remarkable. It was really an accident, but it was remarkable to me. I thought I'd been hand-picked. <laughs> anyway, we had a Sergeant McIntyre, <coughs> and McIntyre was one of these old pro soldiers that benevolent to his troopers, but he'll cut you to pieces if you don't do your duty. And we were competing for a three-day pass. And the war was over, and we were now up in northern Japan. And if we get a three-day pass, they gave us enough time to get down to Tokyo, spend a day there, and a day getting back. And so, boy, I really polished my boots and pressed my uniform and polished my brass, and I, my bed was made perfect and everything. And somehow, in the course of cleaning my rifle, I forgot to clean the barrel. And uh, Sergeant McIntyre and another guy, Corporal Lenimu, who was my squad leader, <laughs> came down. You know how they slam over in that chair and they put their thumb in there that reflects my and there's nothing but lint lin there. And he chewed me up one side and down the other for almost an hour. And then he gave me my, gave me, gave me my pass. <laughs> That's the old army. That's fun experience. Um, I really admired McIntyre. He's dead now. Uh, the, um, Joe Swing, General Joseph May Swing, was the division commander. At that time, he was a two-star. And he was in the same class at West Point as Eisenhower and Bradley. And that was the class, I think it was class of 1915. The stars fell on, you know, all of them got promoted. It was also the class that did the Poncho Villa raid, which, by the way, my dad was on. I don't know much about that. I just know it was one of the big lies he told me. <laughs> but I'm sure he did it. Anyway, Joe Swing was patrician. He was handsome and uh, gray, almost white hair on the side. And he had this jaw. He just looked like the, the ideal soldier. In fact, Westmoreland looks like him. Um, and uh, we had a thing called swing time. And General Swing was sort of, we would all, we'd all go out and run. The whole division, you know, I mean, a jillion men go out on this run, and you, you were given a head start based on your age and your rank. Of course, the old man got the head start, you know. And uh, so the soldier would, would chase his ass all over the place. Trying to beat. Of course, nobody ever beat him. <laughs> and, uh, but he hated, despised the weakness in his officers. And he, he relieved more officers than, I mean, he was, this guy was really, really a great warrior soldier. Um, and um, he married the daughter of the chief of staff. Uh, you know, um, oh, boy, I got him in a block. Um, March, General March, Peyton March. Peyton March and MacArthur were at each other's throats all, all these years. Anyway, he had contacts. I mean, he had really high-level contacts. I mean, we had friends, classmates like Eisenhower and Bradley. That's not too shabby. And you're married to the daughter of the chief of staff. Uh, you know, you got some juice. You know? So he would he would do stuff that nobody else would take a chance on. He just took chances. You know, and uh, was always for his troopers. And he always talked to you as a trooper. Uh, and he made a point to come down at the squad level. You know. You'd be on the you'd be on the not the range, but if you're out on a patrol situation. Remember, when the war ended, we weren't sure which way the Japanese were going to jump, you know, because we had had enough experience to know that that, that it could reverse itself. And uh, so he'd go out on these patrols. This two-star general's out there walking on the patrol, you know, and uh, he took he and he, he got it stuff that guy did. They had to make a raid, you no. Know, they had to make a mission, and they couldn't get an airplane. And I think this was in the Philippines, as I recall. So they got a little Piper Cub type airplane, and he put two guys, one up in the rack and one in the back seat, hanging over the pilot, and fly them in and drop them off. And he made about 25 trips to get these troopers in there. That's the kind of guy he was. So when you're around people like that, there's a saying, 
if you want to be great, get around the near great. So the constant example of being around somebody like that. Now later on, years later, I became his aide de camp as an officer. But this time I'm a buck private. Maybe I, I might have been at that high rank of TFC. <laughs> anyway, Joe Swing and I met his daughter and, and uh, knew about his son. And, um, Mueller thought the world of all of them. But Mueller also would tell you, Don Mueller would tell you that he'd kick your butt, boy, if you didn't conform. But he got to relieve everybody. The division was selected, Joe Swain was selected to bring the peace treaty, you know, the surrender document back to D.C. And Joe Swain was the guy that had to choose the, cur the courier. So he picked Tom Mesero. And Tom, Tom was either a major or a captain, a four-year football player at West Point, you know, a real hard charger, combat guy, you know, done everything, you know. And uh, I think he was on the drop. Or, anyway, he chose him to take it back. Why would he choose a guy like that? Because he wanted to show people what kind of a unit they come from. And the, the, the 11th constantly was in trouble. Uh, with We get in fights with the first cab and, you know, and just make asses out of ourselves. But again, it was always this pride we had that, that we were good at what we did. And, uh, but if you did something wrong, if you committed a crime, you would, in, in the 511th anyway, you would go into what they call Ponzi's rest camp. Ponzi was a, the, the sergeant, the, the provost sergeant, and he was cruel. So the guard detail was housed in the prison, I mean, in the, in the stockade. And you'd see this. This, this Nazi <laughs> working our, our troopers over, you know. These guys are bad guys anyway, you know. And uh, so you, you have the other side of this thing, you know, you know there's punishment for stuff that you did, you did wrong, so you didn't do much wrong. So he was, he was a person that you um, uh, modeled yeah. Yeah. your career after. I do a lot of reading and I, a lot of biographical stuff. And I've gone way back beyond the Civil War, I mean, the Revolutionary War, back into the War of 1812. And, the lives of the, the presidents who were who were soldiers and uh, like Lincoln uh, took on a mob who were, wanted to lynch this Indian. Get that the, the, the ultimate president. He takes him on and he says, "Come on, take me on." You know, this is the president. <laughs> this is the guy going to be president. He's that that kind of that looks to me like something I got to be able to do. You know, George Washington had this. He was probably the only brilliant general in the Revolutionary War, and he he had insight into what we should do and shouldn't do. Teddy Roosevelt, as far as I'm concerned, was a fraud. He, he didn't didn't make the charge up a San Juan Hill, and he took credit for it. You know, well, you don't need to do that. So you had a lot of people that you were able to model over your career. Oh yeah, yeah. And as a kid, How about Christ? <laughs> yeah, and as a kid, as a kid, um, those people stood out. Mm -hmm. um, Youngster, what was it like uh, as a youngster going to school as a, and as a military brat? Now you were, your father was a career military. Yeah. So tell me about how his career affected you as he became officer himself. Well, most of the kids originally, my first couple of years in school, were many of them were army brats and many were Hawaiian army brats. Um, but I was small. I was a little guy, and uh, uh, most of my classmates were big, especially if they were Hawaiian. So I had to hold my own, you know, and uh, I often couldn't hold my own because these guys were tougher than me. And uh, but uh, I remember coming home to my mom and saying, "Got the shit kicked out of me." And uh, she said, "Well, go back and kick the shit out of them." You know, I never heard my mother swear again. <laughs> so uh, you, you know, life lessons are they're there all the time. You know, even today, even today, I'll leave this house and I'll go someplace, and something will happen, and I'll have to have a new lesson what my behavior should be. I, I work out at a very well-to-be gymnasium here. And there's a couple of guys that come in and they just really think they're something. And one guy started making remarks one day about President Bush. And so a friend of mine was there and I said, you know, I don't need to hear this from you. And uh, so I hurting your feelings. <laughs> so I got up from the bench, bench press, walked over to him, put my finger right next to his nose and I said, no, but I'm going to hurt you. And I don't know if I could have pulled it off, you know. But I stopped, you know, I stopped. Or I could have let it go by and crawl out the door whimpering. But I stood up for what I thought was appropriate. Diana says I'm nuts. <laughs> and I probably am. But again, it always goes back to that hold your ground, hold your ground. Uh, I did that 
Well, we talked about some people, you know, that we've had to do that with. And, uh, but I was little, and uh, I took up uh, swimming and running. I was swimming because I'm Hawaiian, and I did very well, both locally and nationally on that one. How did you get involved in running? I so said you've been doing that your whole life. The Army. <laughs> Everybody runs in the Army. But I got to, I got to, how did I get involved? I could be successful. Every step was a success. So they were beating me at the, the five meter, the five thousand meter, ten thousand meters, and the mile, and you know, and the marathon. But they couldn't beat me on the distance. So I found my little niche in the distance stuff: fifty miles, hundred miles, six day run. You know, so you know, I I made my way. You know, and the, after I got into it, uh, one year I ran four and a half thousand miles in a single year. It was nineteen seventy six. And I use that as my salute to America, our, our 200th anniversary. And um, nobody runs four and a half thousand miles in a single year. So now I've got it done. I've got to go find something else to do, you know. And uh, so, of course, I'm, I'm water, water oriented and more towards sailing and scuba diving and, and uh, that stuff. You know. But I, even there, I found that I had to do something besides spearfish, you know. I mean, I used to spearfish because we ate that, but ridiculous. I didn't have to do that forever. So I got into competitive swimming and I did very well, very well. So when you were in school, what was the thing that, that kind of uh, began to allow you to discover yourself as a teenager in school? And where, where were you in school at that time? I learned how to read. Really read. And besides curiosity, there was this idea that maybe there was something there that was more important than me. And I quickly discovered there's a lot there more important than me. And there's a lot of folks that went before me that had something to say. I accidentally read The Life of Gandhi and uh, St. Francis during the same month. Boy, if you don't think that makes an impression on you. So that, that began to fo help me focus on possessions and power and, and um, fruitful search. I happen to be a Catholic. I don't happen to be a Catholic. I'm a Catholic, okay? But I'm an intellectual Catholic. I deal with, with the idea of Catholicism and not the ritualistic stuff. I had no gripe against people who want to go through all that stuff. But, um, uh, and I'm a convert, so I found a lot of a lot of stuff in there that excited me. When Christ spoke directly, you really better listen, because he had something to say, and he said it with great force. Remember when he came down to the Sea of Galilee and all the, the fishermen and hobos were down there, and he said, come be fishers of men. It wasn't, please, <laughs> come be fishers of men. And then at the Feast of, uh, of Cana, when his, when, at the wedding feast, when they ran out of wine, and his mother came to him and said, we ran out of wine, and he said to her, woman, what will you have me do? Not mother, <laughs> but woman, <laughs> you know. And uh, then when they cured the leper, and only one of them came back, and he said, where are the rest of you guys? <laughs> so I began to read into that, his personality. I want to know about the personality of him. Of him. And, and not because I was studying Catholicism, but I, the guy had something to say, you know, and uh, developed a very personal relationship there. Still do, and but not 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 lace panties, you know. This is he's a real man, you know. And to have suffered like that, there's got to be a lesson in there for me. I don't parade that out there. I mean, I, you're the first guy I ever talked like about that. Diana is a Catholic, and we're both on our second marriage, and. Most of our close friends are priests, <laughs> and, uh, yeah. and we just got back from the life of Conley with Father Damien. And that's a big, big thing for me. I, every morning, the reason I, here's how I got to be a Catholic. I have four volumes of Butler's Lives of the Saints, and every morning since the day I started even thinking about religion, I've read one or two stories of the lives of the saints. And I've been through that. That's four volumes, four or five times. And you can't read that stuff without getting a lesson. So that answer your question is, yeah, that's something heroic about it. I'm fascinated by Father Damien. 
Um, in fact, I took his name, my baptismal name. And I had one very clandestine, very brief clandestine, nothing heroic, assignment in the military, and I chose the name of Damien Anton. Damien after Father Damien Anton after St. Anthony, you know, you figure that out. <laughs> but he's, God, what a man he was. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm confessing through one time. And uh, it's easy for, it's easy to get caught up in all your accolades and your achievements and, and miss the thing about self-development. See, we've got a big problem in the military. Every time we turn around, every time we pee, we've got to get a medal, you know? You know the kind of folks I'm talking about. And if we can't earn it, we can, we can manufacture some way. And I've been challenged a couple of times on that stuff, and uh, I just don't respond to it. Um, you notice there's no place in this house that the metal's are hanging up? You can go any place in this house, even though they're in frames, they're not hanging up, and they never will. Um, you happen to get the one picture, because that was our wedding picture. And, uh, when you, as you, as you were growing up, and you had lots of models, and, and that's affected you all through your life. Now, when you were in high school, uh, before you finished school, uh, where, where was that school? <laughs> I want to forget that. <laughs> yeah, I know, there's, there's always, you know, no, you know something joking. that happened. And what was the kind of classes that you took, and what, what was interesting to you? Okay, I started high school in a place called Watsonville, California the apple capital of the world, also the site for East of Eden by John Steinbeck. Um, I was, again, very small. And these were all farm kids that went there, big farm kids, and all very, very wealthy Slavic people who owned all the ranches. This is a setting for uh, mice and men, too, by the way. And I couldn't find my way. Number one, I had a very, very abusive stepmother. And so I decided that I had to do something about my situation. And that's the nice thing about being a military brat, you get very inventive. So I located a place to live in the attic of the YMCA. The loft, and to get in and out of it was tricky, but I won't go through that. And got myself a little sleeping bag and up there. And then um, I was 13 years old. And uh, Father's overseas. Um, my stepmother had been beating me since I was a little kid, and I thought, fuck you. you know? <laughs> so you had it. Yeah, yeah, and I was afraid. You know, I'm, to this day, I, I'm still afraid of her. She's dead now, but I couldn't, when I came back from Vietnam, I couldn't walk down the same street that she lived on. I mean, that kind of embedded terror. And I knew I had to overcome that. You know? And then so I got. 13, you had it, and you took off, and did you run it? Technically ran away, right? No, no. I, in the same town, I went down to the Y, found the attic, talked to one guy that worked there, and said, I'm going to stay there. I didn't ask him, I'm going to stay up there. He thought it was for a couple of days. Well, it wasn't. It was for about almost three years. <laughs> and uh, got several jobs, worked in the fruit, uh, the harvest, uh, drove a little pickup truck delivering autos, auto parts, washing cars, but, but I made it, you know? Has beautiful young, just absolutely gorgeous little blonde that I was going with, you know, and that was more symbolic to everybody else that I was not that I was, that I was something. I had this gorgeous woman say, "Look at me, boy. I might be little, but I got this broad." <laughs> and, uh, isn't that dumb? <laughs> well, how did those three years shape you? Um, I could hardly wait to go in the army because I knew I was running out of gas. This is kind of a confession. I would say a dollar a week out from everything else. And on Saturday morning, I would go down to this little cheap, greasy spoon restaurant and I would get ham and eggs and hash browns. That was my big thing. That was all I had to live for, other than Joni Rommel. That's all I had. That's the one thing I, I, the one thing I, could, I could cling to. I got into the junior ROTC when I was 13, I think. Stayed with that until they... The Army had developed a program called ASTRAP, Army Specialized Reserve Training Program. And this is for 16-year-old kids that would be accelerated in their education and given much more extensive military training, more <laughs> extensive military training, close order drill, KP, you know, that kind of stuff. And we would spend a month 
uh, in the Easter break and a month in the summer break on little rifles doing this rifle marksmanship. And, uh, and I was happy doing it. And I got a little uniform, you know. I think I made corporal. <laughs> uh, anyway, then if you didn't cut it, you already signed a waiver to go in the Army. The day you were 17, you were going to the Army. And of course, my grades started to slip, and, and I found myself halfway in the regular Army. And, uh, but the, the, since there was never any question in my mind that I was going to go in the Army, it was, you just went in the Army in our family. And it was a refuge for me. It was a bigger refuge for me than for most because I had this terrible problem with uh, David. Uh, Joni. Oh, anyway, I went. Uh, I, I, I didn't have to go to basic because I've been to all the door shit. So I went right into the airborne school and right overseas. And yeah. What year was that? Uh, it was 40, 40, 45. Um, I think I, got, I think I think I got overseas in January of forty five. Joni and I corresponded. That died. You know. In the meantime, I met a Filipina girl that I was madly in love with. All this stuff helps you get through. You know, you're, you're searching for this affection and love and validation. And um, I was doing okay because I was a, I was a rifle marksman. I was a scout, a rifleman scout, parachute, doing my parachute jumps, having a great time. Had some friends. Good food's better in the airport, <laughs> uh, I think. Uh, made some contacts with the senior people, senior officers. Anyway, the girl, her name is was. Lourdes Casas, Lourdes Casas, and in Japanese, Casas means umbrella. In Spanish, it means house. Okay, you know that. I should tell you. They like Ramirez. He's certainly not Jewish. <laughs> okay. Anyway, my son and I, my oldest son, the FBI, yeah. who is just a darling guy, just a darling guy, um, went to the Philippines as a guest of the Philippine government. Not as a liberator, but as an Olympic guy. And uh, when we arrived, somebody put a little clip in the Middle Times or whatever the newspaper is that we, Timmy and I were there revisiting and mentioned that I had been a liberator. They, they don't say liberator, they say liberator. And Lou, I mean Lourdes, saw the clipping and tracked us down in our hotel. And we had a telephone conversation, and so she, she said, I want to take you to dinner. Can I bring my son? Yes, ma'am, so forth. Uh, so anyway, we got to the Manila, Manila Hotel Extravagant Ballroom Number 3. <laughs> and Timmy and I were there early, we're making coffee or dental wise, whatever. Timmy, Timmy is, a, is a very bright guy. Very bright and very handsome guy, and the women love him. You know? <laughs> he's tall and he's muscular and he's fast. <laughs> uh, so here comes Lourdes. She's walking through the lobby, and the lobby crew parted like the Red Sea. <laughs> Everybody's bowing and deferring to her, and she came up, and we both stood and shook hands, and you know, the, 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 all the restaurant staff are. Because the rest of the, oh, we got the queen here or something. And uh, Timmy said, something's going on, Dad. <laughs> and so we sat down. And I said, well, Lourdes, how, how goes it with you? Good luck. Says, I have a nickname, Lulu, which is common for Lourdes. Okay? And uh, she said, I also have a new last name. Oh, okay. I thought, oh, man, this is going to be bad for me. She's going to be married an Anglo or something like that. He says, it's Kazan. She is Manuel Kazan, the first president of the United States' grand daughter-in-law. How about that? <laughs> so Timmy, next question I tell me is, where'd you guys meet? And of course, I wasn't going to tell. And she said, I'll tell him. And she told him the whole story. And then uh, she said something like that. She says, Timmy, make no mistake about it. Your dad's a real lover. And so from then on, Timmy's always called me the stud. <laughs> a nice story, yeah. but it's true. Well, Pres President Quezon, this is his niece? No, it's his, his son, it's his son's wife, or son-in-law's wife. No, 
It's his grandson's wife. Ah, okay. There you go. Okay. Emmanuel Kazan was the first president of the Well, I met her. You did? Uh, I went with, uh, with Commodore Alcaraz. Did you really? To the Philippines. Okay. He once spoke to the academy. Okay. Uh, and uh, Tokyo Noche Academy in Bangu. Hmm. And, uh, and, and he had a very strong relationship with Kazan. Mm. Because he, you know, he was one of those first captains of Cuba. Mm. So it's well, fascinating. Cuba. What a very interesting small oh, world. God, that, so, um, and and uh, well, now that she told your son, you know, how did you meet her? <laughs> <laughs> how did I meet her? <laughs> uh, you can't put this in, okay? Oh, well, we'll, we'll skip it. Okay, you can tell yeah, me later. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and when when you had um, this, you had a, a, a you entered now. In January of 45, and that was just uh, Luzon and Leidy's invasion. Tell me what you did at that time. Okay, let's go back on the, on the dates. Okay? Let me give you the hallmark dates. Okay. The one you're probably most interested is the raid. <clears throat> and the, the January, February, March period was the, was the capture of Manila. The next important date is um, August the 30th. Uh, Theoretically, they declared peace on the 15th, but August the 30th was when we left the Philippines headed for Japan, and the surrender occurred on September 2nd. Okay. I think my figures are right, okay? <clears throat> I was a rifleman scout. <clears throat> uh, the, I was Tell me what a rifleman scout is. Most people, most people don't know what that is. Okay. That's the guy that gets shot first. <laughs> <laughs> He's the guy that goes out in front of everybody with his M1 rifle and a couple of rounds of ammunition, a day's rations, and tries to see what's going on out there. He's got a patrol behind him, and uh, usually about 12 men. And it's usually one squad. And what's the distance between the, the uh, forward scout? Scout guy, he's probably out there 500 yards. Depends on the terrain. If you're in the jungle, uh, they're not going to pick you off. They're going to pick off the second guy and let you go through. And uh, so, the trick was to try to be so observant and so stealthy that you could spot any kind of a foliage break. When I, you know, elephant grass, stuff like that, is easy, it's easy, easy to see when it's been disturbed. Japanese were very clever, very clever. And they were very good soldiers. The reason the Japanese soldiered so well was not because they were good soldiers, but because they were afraid of their NCOs. Their NCO used to beat them, literally. So they were highly motivated <laughs> to fight you rather than the NCO. And, uh, you know, and I don't think it's ever come out. Um, the, um, maybe it did, I don't know. Uh, my impression was uh, I had very little contact, almost zero. Uh, when I, met, I went on several patrols, come back with limited amount of information. F Company was not involved in the drop. B Company was. And B Company was a composite on the, um, of the of the 511. I think guys like our friend, you know, he claims a lot, but the truth of the matter, he wasn't. Um, the Battle of Manila, in most cases, was door to door, or house to house. It was a very confusing period. Well, tell me the units, uh, the names and the numbers of the units that you were involved in and how they were involved. You mean in World War II? Yes, in, in, in as far as. Uh, <laughs> so, I, was, I was only in one I F Company 511. You know? uh, well, wait a minute. I take it back. I, 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 the, when the when the 511 was headed for Okinawa and then to Japan, I was re I got I got a small boat background. I'm a really fairly good small boat, small boat guy. I'm also a very good survival guy. That sounds God, that sounds vain, <laughs> but it's true. I'm good. I say, look at me. I'm still here. <laughs> but, uh, I was sent down to Zamboanga. And ostensibly to do some, uh, uh, the, the jargon is search and rescue now, but it wasn't then. You just go down to Zamboanga. You know? Zamboanga was the heart, heartbeat of the Islamic part. 42% of that area is Islamic. In Mindanao. Yeah. And that Zamboanga is a site of all the bullshit that's going on. And um, this is also where Royal was trying to do her. And, and before it was somebody else, <laughs> they're never going to solve it. They, they don't begin to understand that the Islamic people want a separate nation. And, you know, they got 7,070 some odd islands, give them, <laughs> give it to them. 
They won't do that, though. And now uh, Arroyo is talking about she's, she's bailing out of her offer not to run again, and now she's going to run again, see? So who could believe anybody down there? And she's surrounded by such idiots. Estrada, President Estrada, the Cowboys and Indians movie star, and his best buddy is also going to run, you know? So it's a hopeless situation. And I often wonder, why in the hell did we ever go back? <laughs> uh, but, you know, it wasn't, you know, you look at it objectively, was it really worth even so much as one military death? MacArthur returned because MacArthur shot his mouth off about returning. Uh, I'm not sure it was worth it. We certainly didn't change the Philippines. And look, now there are our enemies. Same with Japan, same with Germany. Uh, we saved France's ass. And so there's, there's this philosophical thing that goes on with me is if I had a second life to live as a soldier, I probably would do it much differently. I think I would become a cook. <laughs> but anyway, I was always in F Company 5, but when I went down south, it was either 8th Army or 6th Army, I've forgotten which, that had that jurisdiction. Um, I was there for, let's see, until, God, I would guess, I would guess just about Thanksgiving of 46. Um, that's something, because yeah, I had, I had Thanksgiving dinner at, up in Morioka. Um, and, uh, but I was having a good time. I'm operating my little boat, doing running errands, you know. And so, and, and that was the whole company, or just just part, just the, just me. <laughs> just you. Yeah, I, I was detached. I, because they, they needed. I guess on your profile they have that, that stuff in there. They looking for small boat guys. I had actually been assigned to the transportation corps briefly in the states, on the shipboard, but uh, you no. Know, I guess they found and I. I might, have, I might even found out about a volunteer to get out of the jungle, you know. I like these cities. <laughs> I heard the women down there were better, better looking. <laughs> the food was better. You know what a balut is? Huh? A balut is a duck egg that's, that, that's matured and not quite hatched, and you're supposed to eat them. <laughs> so we, <laughs> we make this joke about, uh, you know, if you're going to get sent, sent down at San Boanga, the, San Boanga the, 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 the balutes are better to eat down there. <laughs> So anyway, well, I had a good time. And, and so uh, you were detached for that period of time. Mm -hmm. And uh, now, as the, now what happened during that period of time in the Philippines? Uh, you were detached in January, February? No, I, I missed, missed the drop entirely. Well, the, the F company didn't, wasn't in the drop. And so, uh, well, tell, tell me about um, how some of those experiences you had at that time before the, uh, the uh, before Manila was was occupied mm -hmm. in that period of time, and you were all were you were in Thailand down in, in Mindanao at that time? No, no, no. arrived in the Philippines, outskirts of Manila, somewhere early in January. Um, the raid was in February, February twenty third. We were still. Tell, tell me about that, right? Because I got a lot of different perspectives, and I, I want to have a guy who was actually involved with some of the stuff, not necessarily involved in that way itself. Okay. Um, anytime you, you read or hear about it, you've got to sort out myth, lies, and reality. Okay? I think I can do that. <clears throat> One of the myths, reality, or lies was that MacArthur became sensitive to the, the, the prisoners of several prison camps. One is, is rumored that the Japanese pour gasoline on some prisoners and lit them a fire. I do not know if that's true. I've never been able to find any documentation. I've heard Filipinos refer to that. And this is not racial with me, but if you read anything about the Philippines, you find there's a lot of exaggeration. You know? and they're good people, and, and, and there are lots and lots and lots and lots of close friends. But I don't know if that story is true. I do know that the Japanese were brutal with their prisoners, especially military prisoners. So anyway, MacArthur allegedly 
had pangs of guilt that we should liberate San Tomas, the one up north with the Marines, which they did. I think it was Band of Brothers, it was that story, yeah, who knows. Um, what's the name of the place? Capitoline? Capitoline, yeah. yeah. Right. Uh, and, in fact, I know somebody lives there in that town, that's here in the United States now. Yeah. And the civilian prisoners of war, civilian internees, prisoners of war, any term you want to use, uh, that they would liberate those. Well, let's go to San Tomas real quick, because they get that away. And the CAV supposedly liberated San Tomas, the first CAV. But that was a protracted negotiation because the Japanese commander would not surrender. So it wasn't the high risks that our guys had on Los Banos, even though the, 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 there was no blood in Los Banos, the risk was there, you know. Santa Tomas, the risk was that, 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 not that high, although perceived risk was quite high. Well, tell me why, why Los Banos was considered a risk. 59 miles from downtown Manila to Los Banos. Still Japanese territory. 49, 49, miles 49 miles behind, behind the Japanese line, and there was a, a full Japanese infantry division in that area. Whatever reason they decided not to do anything about it doesn't change the fact that you know, fear, real or imagined, is still fear. <laughs> danger, real or imagined, is still danger. Uh, so it seemed that the best approach was a combination of factors. First of all, uh, Butch Mueller had some pretty good intelligence. And he's very, very honest about this. He, he had he'd done his work. And of course, there's a lot of exaggeration from lay people who were never there, or people that, that claimed they were there, or people that wished they were there. You know. And the prisoners themselves did some exaggeration. Now, uh, the 2,147 prisoners and 131 paratroopers of which a couple were Filipinos. On the ground, uh, there was uh, some guerrillas, very small number, and uh, our, is that, was it was our recon, division recon. It wasn't, it wasn't the animal scout stuff. That's a whole different bag. And these are good men. These are all good paratroopers. They had all been well trained. All, many of them were from the, the western states. You know, they grew up cowboys and Indians. And uh, um, so, the idea was to do some sorties over and get some current intelligence and get some intelligence on the ground. And then, uh, now Mueller was not only in charge of the intelligence, he was the operations guy, you know. I don't, did that come out here? You know, he was the guy that was going to be making the decisions. And so then he got Hank Burgess, who was a major in charge of the 1st Battalion. The 1st Battalion, maybe, God, if they had 300 men, I'd be surprised. But it was a, under under man under equipped unit, and they were going to come in by by these uh, uh, Antrax, which came from another unit, and they were actually diverted for this thing. The 187th or the 188th was supposed to come in by by truck, and um, over uh, Route One or wherever it was, and do the evacuation by truck. And I've never been able to figure out how they found out that the Amtrak's were going to be in place and the trucks were going to go in. The story I heard that seems to me the plausible sense to me is they were on another mission who happened to be near those dungeons as a backup, but uh, I didn't see any cannons in the back of that place. So I, can't, I have to guess, as an officer who's got now a little experience, I have to look at it and say, man, that's, the information is weak. <laughs> now, I know one guy, two guys, who actually made the raid, uh, DOE, and I became very good friends. We were co-founders of the, of the Joe Swing chapter of Left Airborne. And the guy that was part of the, the small artillery contingent, three men. I met the guy that was in the, in fact, he's an, SR, he's an SMR guy, the guy that led the, 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 uh, the Amtrak in. Uh, he's a photographer. Uh, I'll get his name for you in a second. Make a great interview. He's married to a gorgeous woman. Uh, Aiken. Aiken was the, in the first Amtrak coming in, and eventually became a paratrooper himself, and eventually became the commandant of the jump school. 
How's that <laughs> for a coincidence? Eh? A lot of that stuff went on. Okay, so anyway, uh, at 6.55, I think the planes took off, give or take. And as soon as they were in the air, uh, there was some kind of formal communication between the ground forces. Anyway, the guys on the ground started firing with, with a few guerrillas and, you know, and guys like that. And they did a pretty good job of slaughtering the, uh, the Japanese sentries who allegedly were doing their exercises with their rifle stack. Again, I don't know for sure. There's so much bullshit with that. <laughs> and it, it gets better every time I hear it. Um, and I think I've read everything on the raid, all the versions. Everybody let it. <laughs> and, uh, anyway, the guerrillas and our, our recon unit when they're killing people, the the D company, which was made of uh, remnants of uh, the machine gun company and some other part of the, of the armament uh, from another from the headquarters first, and they anyway, they dropped, and allegedly they dropped at 400 feet. Now the normal height for a drop is 1,200 feet, but there've been lots of drops at 400. Feet. But you don't, you can't make any mistakes because there's no room for it. You can't erase it, you know. Once you're out of that plane, and if it delays, you're gone. So that was, I thought that was kind of heroic. But you know, the trouble is that the paratroopers were too stupid to know that it was dangerous. <laughs> so, uh, and they did the cleanup, and then they began to round up the, and the Amtrak's now are coming over, and they're, they're landing on a beach in a place called Laguna. Not Los Banos, but Laguna. <laughs> and, uh, and, they were Amtrak um, from the prison camp up to Laguna and then out across the Villa Vida prison. Now, all this is still behind the line, and Villa Vida prison was also behind the line. And it's rumored that they burned the, the, the huts because of, I'm, I'm a, I have a certain amount of scholarship you know, at stake in this thing, okay? uh, that it was rumored that they burned everything down because it, refugees wouldn't leave, I mean, the prison wouldn't leave, you know, who knows? Um, you see the Amtrak photos that George has got, and uh, you see them in the mud, and you know, and this, I still can't figure out if it's ever killed. I, I hear rumors one way or the other, you know, and one, one says it is, and one says, you know, who knows. Anyway, it was a pretty dramatic raid. Now, had the Japanese felt that that was an important thing to defend, they would have defended it. They were probably just as happy to get rid of those people as, as we were to rescue them. I don't think it was any lack. I'm just guessing now, okay? And I make sure, make sure that I'm just guessing. There have to be a tactical reason for the Japanese to attack. And in the absence of one, I suspect they were probably relieved. Now, kind of an anecdote to this, a guy by the name of Koichi, I think, was the commander of the camp. And he disguised himself as a Philippine laborer, farm laborer, field worker, and they eventually caught him. And the other character in this thing is General Yamashita, who was supposedly the beast of Bukenthal, whatever it was. It turned out he wasn't that way at all. He was a fine officer. Anyway, they were both executed in Los Banos. Can you imagine that? The, the, the poetic justice there. And one of the nuns is supposed to have looked up to the heavens and said, oh, look at the angels. You know? That's not true either. <laughs> we call ourselves the angels. That came from I forgot the, the, our provost sergeant or somebody like that, going into the 8th Army and the, when, the, when the GIs were back in the, at Camp McCall and uh, going to the provost sergeant and say, any of our angels here today, you know? But, you, but history, my father was so smart, he said, history is a whore. It's a whore. And that's true. It's hard to get, and if you read ancient history, uh, yeah, who knows what really happened, you know? Uh, we redigested and digested. It, it, what's the lesson there, though? The lesson is this country stands on the idea they're not going to permit abuses of innocent people. If they can, that's why we're in Afghanistan, that's why we're in, you know, so forth. No, we're committed to this principle. No other nation's like that. What, so when you were, um, I'll tell you what General Mueller said. Fantastic story. I'll, I'll, I'll recount that afterwards. But um, at that point, the battle for Manila was still going on. Yeah. And, and several months, and the Japanese Marines decided to defend and all that stuff. Uh, where was
was your unit involved in all of this? And what happened after that was Bonyus and, and uh, where was uh, F and B and those guys at this point? You know, uh, there's a, a uh, Colonel um, Ed Latte, who was the CG, uh, the, the regimental commander of 511th. He wrote a book, something like The Making of an Angel or something like that. He is pretty lucid about what going on. They literally almost fought door to door, house to house, for a portion of that time. But again, when you read that stuff, uh, it's hard to figure out what really happened. Um, but as far as I can remember, uh, the reason I brought up the line, there's a thing called the Ginkgo Line. And uh, apparently they were on that, that salient they were trying to. And uh, I knew one guy who was in Afghani long after, I mean, who, who was there before me and, and when I was down in Zandwanger, who would talk about it, and he's, he's gone now. And he used to say, there's F Company and then there's F Company. Now, what the hell does that mean? It took me a long time to figure out this, that there were some guys that were shooting, some guys that weren't shooting. <laughs> and uh, so uh, I suspect probably they were on the Ginkgo line and the guys that were riflemen. Uh, what were you doing at that time yourself? I was headed down to Zandwanger. You were in route? Yeah, oh yeah. The, yeah, yeah. Got my boat in Manila and went down. I picked up a boat in, in, in Manila Harbor. Navy gave me a boat and took it down all by myself. Uh, That's a long way. By I'm, a good I'm a good sailor. By <laughs> the day, uh, whatever it is. I, I stopped off for lunch. <laughs> is it that, that, that far? I didn't, I didn't, that didn't sound right. Because uh, you can, I have to look at the map, but uh, I, I, I have no awareness that it was a difficult thing. You know, I made the crossing from Hawaii to Japan single-handed in a sailboat with no motor, you know, so I'm not exactly a slouch at that. You know who Bobby Oakes is? Okay. He and I tell bullshit stories all the time. And he queried me about it, you know, and I said, do you remember when you made your last run in, in uh, Cape Cod, you know? I don't. Hey, I was 17 years old. At that time? Yeah, I'm not a kid, you know? I, didn't even, I don't think I even owned a razor. <laughs> you guys expect me to recall that? Where was F and D coming in? <laughs> They're probably in a little latrine. Yeah, so when you were in Zamboago at that time, that would have been in, uh, uh, let's see, April, May, June, July of 45. Yeah. In August 45. And you were then en route down to Zamboago. No, I got to Zamboago. It took me about a week. And um, the, uh, actually I had one of the, one of the guys, an Air Force guy, an Army Air Corps guy, that we had picked up, um, it was a, not a rescue, but he was, that's how we got him, because he had been shot down. So search and rescue to try and find Americans who were trying to get out. Right? That's what they told us. <laughs> I mean, we learned that we were search and rescue about 20 years later. <laughs> <laughs> you were just trying to find people. <laughs> yeah, right. In fact, they had a search and rescue badge in the Air Force, and uh, somebody, Dick Mitchell, wanted me to get it. And I said, oh, you know, what, what do I need another badge for you? And what, and what was, uh, and did you actually find some people? Yeah, have people, but these weren't, these weren't, uh, these were some Filipinas, um, some diplomatic type folks, you know, commercial folks. When the, when the Japanese wouldn't go into Zamboanga, believe me, they would not, they, they cut their heads off, you know. Um, I'm just trying to remember, I was operating a boat, you know, I was not a, a diplomat. I was looking for women. <laughs> beautiful women. In oh, men God. Yeah. Those Islamic women are just beautiful. And so now you, you were there for all the way till uh, almost a year. No, crisis. no. But I, 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 got, I got to, uh, yeah, you're right. But I was there February 46. I had Thanksgiving dinner at Morioka. So you're all the way until, until uh, October, November of 46 then? Yeah, and you know, it, it's like, it's a little, a little, not vague, it's like it never happened. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and I've said that before to people, it's like, that somebody else was doing that. That was your first time in the Philippines. Mm -hmm. uh, and I no, no, I was there as a kid. You were there as a kid? Yeah. And now that was as a, uh, as a, as a military brat? Right. The first time? Right. How old were you then? Maybe six. Six years old. Yeah. What was your 
was what was your first experience with the Philippines when you were sixty? What was it? What was your impression? Oh, I love the Philippines. I love the Philippines to this day. I love the Philippines, and I love the Filipinos, and Filipinas, especially the Filipinas, <laughs> uh, if I can trust them. <laughs> and they're lazy, they're dishonest, but they're wonderful people. They want to have strong family ties. Their their only problem is they they're lousy politicians. <laughs> What was it experience as a six-year-old? What was it? Uh, we're starting on take two uh, of uh, new Colonel Leno, uh, William Wallach, and we're at his home in uh, West Hills, and it's the 24th of June, uh, 2003. Uh, Colonel, uh, we were just wind down our first tape with some of the time frame that you're involved in the Philippines uh, as a uh, search and rescue <laughs> at Mindanao, Zamboanga. Uh, and uh, you were there at the time uh, that uh, the war was declared over. Is that or were you still in Manila? No, I was at Zamboanga. Okay, and, and what was the, what was the news like when you finally got the news that the war was over? You know, I, I saw a question on a questionnaire. My my first reaction was uh, I don't remember. You know, that was my very very first reaction. And then I started doing some thinking about around that situation. And my problem became I've listened to everybody else's story, that their story almost became my story. And you may remember that I took a group back to Japan. The surrender, you know. And uh, the yeah, okay. uh, Colonel, when we were talking, we were talking about the uh, uh, the news that you received. That uh, uh, well, first let me back up a little bit. A lot of people heard about the atomic bomb, but nobody knew what it was. Mm -hmm. uh, tell me what when you got that news of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and, and what did that? How was your response to that? I guess my, I got to, when I answered, I, I got to discern what, what I know now and what I knew then. And having been to Hiroshima, my impressions, first of all, I, I certainly wasn't technically oriented enough to know what the hell it meant, you know, technically. Uh, I just knew it was a big bomb, you know, it's been, for my mind, it's like a big firecracker. <clears throat> um, so much of that period of time, as I said, I kind of developed other people's view of things as though they were my view of things, and I wasn't even there. You know? And that, that's a fairly bad habit with with uh, nostalgia. Um, and was there, now, when the war was over, where, where were you when you got the news? Zamboanga. And were you at sea or? Uh, uh, we, we, you know, there's seven thousand islands in the Philippines. We were operating on all those islands, you know, and those specific down in that area. Um, I had an interest in Magellan, who had you know come come in that area. So I was always looking for somebody who had something to do with Magellan. That scholarship was beginning to develop in me. My my feeling later on, especially when I went to Nagasaki, and this was shortly after the war was over, I had a chance to come back down to the PI from Japan. Um, was the scope. Not so much the horror, but the scope of the damn thing, you know? I mean, Tokyo had been firebombed, and, and so did Yokohama. I, you know, I saw a lot of that. But the scope of that one was just overwhelming. And then when you go start through the, later, I made a subsequent trip and go through the museum and see what, you know, I never felt any national guilt. Um, You know, if you look at the history of World War II, its origins, you better take a closer look, you know, as to how it really started, because you see, too easy, it's too simple to just blame it on the Japanese. They had a, they had a point of view, and um, what did, the question is, was the conflict worth anything? And that's a real fundamental question, especially a soldier's got to ask, did all this, Difficulty, pain, death, anxiety, 
destruction mean anything? Hell, I don't know. <laughs> I'm just another guy walking down the street. I worry every day about, about my kids that are in danger, and uh, I have to ask, you know, is, is, it, is it worth it for them? I don't know. Is it worth it for us in L.A. to get on the drive-by shootings, you know? It's, it's insane. Look, the world's crazy. It really kind of, kind of comes down to that, doesn't it? Um, I went back to, I went to Paris <clears throat> as part of the Olympic thing, and uh, went to the, their military museum. Uh, the 86 Olympics? Mm -hmm. No, was it the 86 Olympics? 84. 84 Olympics, that's right. Okay, but I went right after the games. Yeah, the, one, of the, one of the great benefits of being involved at the level I was at is that you get a lot of goodies, you know, like a free trip. No, it's like a month before the games, but they, they were paying for it anyway. So I went to the, um, the, 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 the Francis Military Museum, and that's where Napoleon's buried, you know, in the big tomb. But what they don't tell you, they have this, it looks like acre and acre and acre and acre of artifacts. And that's the largest military museum in the world. But you know France has never won a war? They've won a couple of battles. And the, the French army in this, or me and his title as being so wonderful, I'm not so sure. I'm not so sure. In Vietnam, they got the crap kicked out of them. And I, I go on and on. The point of it is, is warfare an instrument of uh, national policy? And is it, is it an instrument of mankind? Well, I don't know. And I, you know you, sure, you're going to put up doubts in your mind. Did you do the right thing with your life? I gotta cling to the fact that I did because if I don't, I'll go crazy. And, uh, and I get a lot of, a lot of uh, difficulty because I'm strongly identified with the military among young, younger people. And some of the ones that are most brazen in criticism are the least equipped to criticize it, but I gotta put up with it. So, who knows? Well, when, you, when the war was over, you even had an option, you could have gotten out. Yeah. And made the choice, and when was that choice made to decide to, to uh, re-enlist? Well, the Army had a program called Bootstrap. Or, it's called that now. I don't know what it's called then. I remember I came out of this specialized training program, and I'd always had this, this, this intellectual, educational relationship thing going. So now it's 19... It's a, 1946, coming up on 1947, Thanksgiving. I'm with my buddies, and I was with a couple of really smart guys, you know, and one, one very, very bright priest. And we got beyond the bullshit and got into the heart of some stuff, especially Catholicism and, uh, and the history of the early Revolutionary War. These guys are from the East, you know, so I was getting stimulated, you know, and most of the bohunks I was with are, you know, they drink beer and chase women. <laughs> and I did some of that too, but uh, anyway, uh, I had a hunger. Hunger for knowledge. And it's nothing I did for myself, it's just that's genetic, I guess, anyway. And how I hate stupidity. You, you know, in the Catholic Church, we have a thing called visible ignorance and, and ignorance and visible ignorance. Ignorance is you can't, even if, even if you try. Visible ignorance is you can overcome your ignorance. Okay, so I'm kind of in the, in the visible ignorance stage of my life. And so uh, I knew I'd be coming home in about a year, a little less than a year. And uh, so I'll, I had to decide what I wanted to do, you know. I wanted to go to college, and I could go through the GI Bill and bootstrap a combination of those things. And uh, well, where did I want to go to college? Well, I was living in Santa Cruz before, and I could either go to the University of Hawaii or go to S Santa Cruz. And I worked, I worked on the beach for a while in Santa Cruz. I have a certain nostalgia for that. So now I'm going to go to Santa Cruz. So. San Jose is an Irish University. UC Santa Cruz did not exist at that time. And they had a good school of journalism, and I had a capacity to write, a certain capacity to observe and, and feel. And uh, I'm just emotionally overpowered about the idea that maybe I could be a writer. I mean, maybe I might be that good, you know? Because I was pretty good then, you know? I could write these wonderful letters and give these wonderful little speeches and stuff like that. And at some point, I had to say to myself, how good are you? And you know, when you sit down and, and vanity's in your way and ego's in your way, 
And I had to say to myself, I'm damn good. I'm a good writer. And I could be better if I go to school. And I'm a good historian. And I have an interest in that. And I'm a good humanitarian. I mean, I, I, that, that didn't vocalize it, but that's what I was internalizing. And I'm, I'm being kind of confessional now. OK, so <clears throat> um, I was now married and had a baby. No, I hadn't had a baby yet. Let me take it back. This is 47. This is going on. So I'm going to school. The Army, I'm in the Reserve. I was in both the Reserve and the Guard at one time or the other. Um, and um, the uh, Korean War was smoldering. And uh, hadn't, nothing had started yet. And in June 1950, <clears throat> I am now a junior. And uh, I'm almost broke because I, I just was working saying the same story again. I'm working my ass off to take care of my little family. And uh, um, my wife, too, was also handicapped, by the way. So I volunteered to go on active duty as an NCO. But now I think I'm a buck sergeant or something, something like that. In the guard. Uh, because the reason I didn't go in the reserve, because their armory was farther away than the guard armory. And the unit was the 159th Infantry. And uh, anyway, I, I volunteered to go back on active duty shortly after June 15, when the Korean War started. Now, I've got one combat infantry badge already from World War II. And I got the combat infantry badge. You, you have to be infantry and have infantry MOS and be in an infantry organization to get the CIV. So I've met all those qualifications, except I, I was operating this boat, see? But I was getting shot at occasionally. So I, I said, no, I'm going to apply. So I had the old man take care of it, and I got my, got my CIV. And if you look at my, my uniform, I don't got no stars on that CIV. <laughs> and, uh, once is enough, you know? Uh, so anyway, go back to Korea. Um, worked my way up to the master sergeant very shortly. Got assigned to the 65th, I'm going to take it back, 3rd Division. I got, excuse me, I'm screwing this up. I got assigned to the 3rd Infantry. Now, little old me, smart enough to know that the 3rd Infantry is the president's own, you know, the Tomb of the Unknown, those guys. I thought, man, I got it made now because when I get to come back, I can get assigned to DC. So my, my, my Jeep driver took me up to this remote part of Korea in the mountains. In the middle of the night, I see this little tiny light up in these mountains. Now, they didn't, the Jeeps weren't heated, you know, it's colder than hell. And, and way up there is this little tiny light, me driving and driving and driving. And finally get into this place, and it's, it's, the light is a mist tint. And um, God, I'm cold. God, I'm terribly cold. We didn't have Farkas, you know, field jackets. Fucked up war. <laughs> anyway, uh, I go to the mess tent and I'm going to say, you, you call it, NCO is called a cook, Cookie, you know. And I was going to say, hey, Cookie, how about some Java, you know? And turn around and this old mess sergeant that I knew. And he said, uh, now I'm, I'm a master sergeant. Said, hey, kid, how you doing? <laughs> and uh, so I said, sit down and got a hot coffee and one of these. Cinnamon rolls was the only, only, only GI cooks could make. I'm in fucking heaven, you know? And uh, I said, man, you, how the hell did you get involved in the 3rd Infantry? No, I guess an elite unit. He said, well, you know, I, I speak Spanish. Uh, this, has been, this has been wasted on me. Well, it wasn't the 3rd Infantry. It was the 3rd Division, 65th Infantry Regiment, Puerto Rican National Guard. I knew I was going to get killed. <laughs> so I went back to see him a couple of days later. I said, how do I get out of this? Because <laughs> I'm not interested in combat. I'm not the least bit interested in combat. And uh, i got to get out of this outfit. Because I, I would get killed. I mean, no question about it. Because they were, they were getting overrun and shit kicked out of them. And I was not, I'm not a hero, you know. I already got my stripes and I'm, I want to go back to school. You know, and all the cowardly excuses that went on my first day. <laughs> So anyway, he pulled some strings, and I got assigned to the Ninth Corps. And then I got assigned to Eighth Army Forward, all within a matter of just weeks. And uh, then when I was at Eighth Army Forward, 
and that's operating near the Seoul. I got there's a thing called the Far East Military District, which is made up of reservists who were there on the, in civilian assignments, and um, they would let these guys get into two regular army units, maybe. One was the 8240th, which is the United, UNFIC, United Nations Partisan, United Nations Partisan Forces in Korea. It's a mixed bag of Koreans, and these guys operate behind the lines. And these are all guys that were out of, out of uh, stockades? No, this, you, these, these, are, they're all, these are real good, good troopers. They're just a little crazy, that's all. <laughs> They're gung-ho, hard chargers. Um, how do we get on the stockade thing? I don't know. Well, uh, what's on there? I, I guess that somehow I got a... a that you feeling okay? Yeah, let's see. <laughs> I got you here. <laughs> all right, anyway, these guys are legitimate. So th th this unit was run by United Nations, excuse me, by 8th Army Forward. And it was, it was a United Nations, very small detachment of guys who operated behind the lines. The reserve component part of this thing, 8231st, you know, fair sister units, operated small boats along the coast. Okay, so I'm, I'm, I'm but I'm, I'm an active army guy. I'm not supposed to be in the reserve here. I'm supposed to be in this one where they're, they're going to get killed, you know. But I, I pulled my way around and got into the right one, and so I served with 83, 83rd, 81st for a while, and then returned to the United States. So you were in a, did you end up actually on both? Yeah, I was operating a boat up, up, up and down the east coast of Korea, doing fun stuff, you know. I don't know what the hell I was doing, but I, you know, I had this big boat, you know, and I was taking guys in and out, and uh, we did some uh, ostensibly doing rescues. I suspect, looking back at it now, Rick Thomas has told me that Probably I was picking up CIA guys. He's a CIA. CIA. Wherever you were directed. Yeah. And I mentioned this to Mueller, and he said, yeah, probably. And um, anyway, come back to the States. And so I. would have been, what, 52 then? Yeah. Okay. And some genius told me that the National Guard had developed an officer candidate school. Gentleman's course. Now, for me to get a commission, I'm now 28 years old, 27 years old, and 28 is the top. And uh, I thought, yeah, I'd love to be commissioned. But I got neither the time or the energy to do this, you know, and I sure as so hell can't go on active duty back and forth bending and play, play games with those guys, you know. And um, so I enrolled in for candidate school. And it was a kind of a weekend warrior kind of thing, but it was a, you know, had, it met all the requirements of, of an active army commission. And uh, God, I met some great people there. Some great people. Um, and where was that? Uh, where was that? Alameda. Alameda. Okay. Yeah, and it was the second class. The second, the third company, second class, class of 1953. 100 guys started, 50 guys made it to the halfway mark, 26 graduated. And there are three of us left alive. We were having that, the reunions all about. Um, 1953, so it's been 50 years. Yeah, and uh, yeah, it's our golden anniversary. But the fact that we all all did well, and uh, but it when I got my commission, uh, and I really believe this horse shit about officers and gentlemen. You know, I really believe it. I believe that we set ourselves aside from everybody else. I want to believe it. You know, uh, I want to believe that I was that I had achieved. I valued that commission. And they can joke all they want about our OCS or the, the Guard OCS or anything different. It's still a commission. It's a federal commission, and I got it. <laughs> I, and Rick Thomas and I, General Thomas and I, were, were bucking for an undergraduate against a, a third guy who's now dead. Uh, and, but a guy by the name of um, Stu Peter was selected. Now, Stu is no infantry officer. He's just a nice guy, smart as him, you know. He wound up being the chief financial officer for J. Paul Getty. <laughs> and he was the undergraduate. And so, Rick and, I, and Rick was second, and I was third. <clears throat> and I, I, you know, it ate away at me for years. <laughs> and so I finally confronted that son of a bitch. I said, how did you ever get selected? You, you wimpy little 
lightweight lawyer. <laughs> I mean, you, we, we were 10 times the officers that you were. He said, friends in high places. <laughs> <laughs> I loved it. And, and we, you know, we are, we're dear friends. So then, that's 1953, I got my degree. Uh, I'm now a second lieutenant. I stayed in the Guard for a short period of time, and then I had a chance to go overseas. And uh, active army with a reserve commission. And uh, so I went overseas and uh, got to Yokohama, Japan, uh, and they sent me to Vietnam. Now, this is 1954. Vietnam. Guess who's there? The French. <laughs> and they said, You can't go to Vietnam as a soldier. You've got to go as a civilian. Now, I know enough about the Army regs that if, if, I, if I interrupt my military service, I could jeopardize my retirement, my benefits, you know, so I was really thinking that, but about that one carefully. And somebody said, well, you're not, patri not patriotic enough. And I said, well, what do you want me to do over there that's so valuable? Well, you know, you were born in Hawaii. That's, that's some qualification. You know? and, and you've lived in Japan, and, and, and you've been to Korea. You know, like, uh, all of a sudden, I'm an expert in Asia. Army mentality. He said, no, we want you to observe. You've got a good, strong refugee background. I've done some disaster training with the Red Cross. We're going to send you over there as a Red Cross worker to observe and uh, see about if something breaks loose, where do we put the refugees? So I went to Vietnam uh, for about nine months, 1954. Here's the quirk on this thing. The Vietnam presidential citation is only awarded for that very short period of time for guys that worked on the refugee program. And your little buddy that worked for you <laughs> was wearing it. Uh, no way, because <laughs> there were nine guys there that I know of. But anyway, Lily wears it. That's a little thing. So I, I did select some sites for, for camps, and I did some liaison with the with the uh, French officers, and Vietnamese French officers. And uh, I could see that it was a good chance for me to change my career from infantry to civil affairs. Um, well, it was a very wise decision on my part because civil affairs became part of special operations. And Bill Berkman, General Berkman, who was the chief army reserve, was the one that had that happen. And I had been his deputy at one time. So uh, the Vietnam thing awakened within me this humanitarian thing that I got on. And while I may appear to be a real hard ass, I'm really not. Um, I, I really feel for these people. And I wish we stopped killing each other. You know? and, but I, as a civil affairs officer, I know that I know a lot about the Geneva Conventions, work on trial, the Roach Treaties, um, all the various agencies that are supposed to be helping people, and some of them are skimming it off the top, you know? And I can name one right here locally. <laughs> uh, but I went through the career course, I went to the basic course, then the career course, and the staff officer's course, and, the, and I've been, you know, at CNGS and all that kind of. Now, where did you take those courses when you left Vietnam? Was it 54 or 55? Yeah, I started a whole career. Um, the the public affairs, the, the public affairs, civil affairs. Civil affairs uh, was at Fort Gordon, Georgia. And then they moved the whole civil affairs. For, when it became special ops, then I went to Bragg. And now, of course, in Iraq, it is crucial, crucial skill. Yeah. And I thought about hanging on to my inf infantry, infantry MOS because I am. And I wear my infantry brass. <laughs> yeah, a good friend who's uh, Colonel Allen's uh, public affairs. Mm. Uh, and uh, he's a Marine Corps guy. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, he said, just going to uh, Afghanistan. Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's become critical. It's a great. Before it was kind of a Mickey Mouse thing. Guy Cologne's boy. Guy Cologne's son, mm -hmm. Andre. You know him? Help me. He's a airborne uh, special forces guy, and then he left his MOS mm -hmm. and just went to public affairs, and is uh, is, is now going to the full crowd. Dark, but just doing that. So it was an interesting background. It was very similar. That's why I was yeah. question. You kind of make your own way because if you depend on the army to, to guide your career, forget it. Yeah. And so when you when you went uh, and made that change in Vietnam to public affairs, civil affairs, um, you were then a first lieutenant. 
No, I think I was a captain or a major. Mm -hmm. And what began to happen in your life? How, how did that change? <laughs> a lot of things changed. When you oh, man, I tried divorce. <laughs> and, well, I got you know, by this time, I'm, I'm up to my ass in the running business and it's in the competitive swimming business and uh, going through the, all the upheaval of my personal life. And uh, I began to see something other than the Army as my future. And so by 1984, excuse me, 87, it was time for me to kiss the Army goodbye. And, uh, but I, over the last couple of years, I was just an advisor for the Civil, Civil Affairs Unit. I was very much interested in the Army fitness program. And there's a, there's a general by the name of um, Floyd. Anyway, he's way up high in the medical circles. And I cornered him in D.C. about developing an, an army-wide fitness program built primarily around running. And no fat-ass officers, you know. And he bought it, and, he, and we were able to enforce it. And for that, um, I got the Meritorious Service Medal. Um, Floyd Baker, from Floyd Baker, and I, I already had one meritorious service medal. And then later on, the guard in, in absent, <laughs> absent mind them, they gave me the Medal of Merit for that. On my retirement, they said they had to give me a medal to have find a reason. <laughs> so they found this thing, and I said, okay, I'll make a deal. Give me the Medal of Merit, because I already got one, you know, <laughs> and uh, give me also the commendation medal, and I'm very happy. That's, that's the way it works. That's the way it works. This metal stuff is, is a game, you know. And uh, same with the airborne stuff, you know. Um, all these generals that wear the, the little puny wings, single wings, you know, basic wings, they do it because they know they can't get through the infantry situation unless they're wearing fair wings. Um, those that can't do that or won't do that, they, they get to be part of the air crew, you know, with air crew wings. It's so ridiculous. And now the Air Force has got jillion badges in the world. You got one for the chaplain's assistant <laughs> and the chief librarian. So, but in my case, looking at my chest, uh, yeah, I did okay. Did okay. Nobody can replicate the fighter wings because they don't issue them anymore. So I got, I got you by the ass, you know. My civilian, uh, um, I have a, a civilian service in Vietnam. And you don't ever see that one either, you know. Very rare. I've also got the, you know, the uh, Patrick Henry silver and, medallion. And this one? Yeah, that's the, that's the uh, MOWW. Um, so it's a matter of kind of planning it so it comes out right, like the, Val the Unit Valor Award. You don't see that very often either. So, so what unit has the most valor? Well, the 511. And I was in it. So I said to the boss, and the, the personal guy said, I think I'm entitled to wear this. Please verify. Oh, yes, you are. So you got a piece of paper that says you can wear it. Uh, but the truth of the matter is I did very little stuff that was heroic or even dangerous. I am sure if I would have ran aground in North Korea, <laughs> that would have been, been very dangerous. Or if some Islamic guy wanted to throw a grenade in my boat, that would be very dangerous, but it never happened. I did get hurt twice. Uh, and. Um, Actually, three times. And um, once, once in the boat, once uh, in a parachute fall, and uh, once the guy said, decided that he wanted to kill me with a big can. <laughs> sorry, just sorry. Uh, but again, I, I didn't. I wasn't. A, I wasn't a hard charger combat guy. But you never know it from looking at my chest, you know. Well, when, when you had you had thirty some years, forty two, forty two years of active. Uh, no, no, forty two years period. Oh, oh. Yeah. But most all of that was active. Pretty much, yeah. Uh, and if you were to look at your career in the military, what would be some of the best duties that you had that you would consider your best duties? You know what? There are damn few men, damn few men, who can claim being a rifleman scout in a parachute rifle company. That's an achievement. Dead or alive, that is a real soldier's 
I don't know, and I don't want to do it again, but, but that was, and the second thing I think was, um, being Joe Swing's aide, even for a short time, great lesson. Um, when my dad died, he died in 1964, in Letterman, Letterman Hospital, and he wanted a military funeral. And I was just leaving from Vietnam, so I got a delay of five days, and they had the funeral at the uh, Golden Gate National Cemetery. At Golden Gate? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And my stepmother, that Nazi, <laughs> and my sister uh, were talking just before this happened about what clothes they were going to wear. And I thought, boy, this is really bizarre. I don't and I'm in uniforms. And uh, I'm hoping things roll real quick so I get out of here. And my dad had a buddy in World War I by the name of Maxie Beauchet. <coughs> and Maxie lost his son. He's a pilot in World War II and was killed. And my dad and he were great friends. They'd almost been born together, you know, both New York. Maxie was Jewish. My dad was a Protestant. Uh, and... Uh, other than that, they, they could have been clones. And actually had, uh, which one is it, muscular dystrophy or multiple sclerosis where they have difficulty walking? Sclerosis. Okay. Oh, yeah. And he had braces in the New Orleans. So everybody goes through the, you know, the gun, guns go out, the chaplain does his blessing, everybody's got tears in their eyes and wiping their nose off. And I'm sitting standing way back, you know. I'm not taking that flag under any conditions, you know. Let my sister and my stepmother have it. They can, tear, they can fight over it. And uh, so I stood back and waited for everybody to leave. I would do my, my own little prayer stuff by myself. And uh, so uh, I was waiting for one guy to leave, and it was Maxie Boshe with his crutches. The kind that you hook on your arm, you know. And he walked around. You know, when you're, when you're buried, you go feet first, not head first. So he went around to the to the feet in, and was saluting my dad's grave with his crutches hanging in his arm. I thought, man, that's class. <laughs> that's real class, you know. And uh, so I left with peace. And so that's another little vivid memory. My dad wasn't much of a soldier, but he at least was treated with great respect by both of us. And uh, then when I, when, I, when I actually retired, I retired at Presidio in San Francisco at sunset on a Friday. And they have all the flags of all the nations on the parade ground. And the, there's a tree right in the middle that was where uh, General um, Pershing's family was burned to death. And the cannon. And the color guard. And all that and crap. And we had about seven officers retiring at the same time. And uh, so I said, I'm, well, I, what I'm going to do, and I, and I, knew, the, I knew the commanding general who, who was going to do, do this crap, General Grange. And um, so um, I decided not to wear my decorations, nothing, plain uniform. And I was lucky, I, it was lucky I wasn't wearing my fatigues. <laughs> and uh, so he went down the line, and I'm, and I'm the lowest ranking officer. It was, uh, it was an NCO next to me. And the NCO was crying when they're playing Danny Boy. You know? <laughs> this, is a, this is such a ridiculous charade, you know. <clears throat> so the general came down and he said uh, something like, uh, Colonel Wallet, Major Colonel, my, my Colonel, not the Colonel Wallet, uh, hate to see you go. So I said, Yeah, sir, I understand that, you know. And uh, let me give you a bit of advice, General. Keep your day job. <laughs> <laughs> Who else but me would pull that kind of shit? You know? And it just kind of caps off my whole cavalier attitude about don't get too serious about anything. You know, it'll take you away. I'll tell you when you get to the Olympic Games, you, that's serious, boy. That is so serious, and you, that takes the wind out of you real quick. And you retired in what year? Eighty-seven. And eighty-seven. Mm. And the Olympics was the year before. Eighty-four. Eighty-four. And you were still on active duty. And what was your role with the Olympics? I was the director of the two classic events, the men's, men's marathon and the women's marathon. The women's marathon was important. Uh, not as important as the men's in that respect, but it was the first time it was ever held in the Olympic Games. 
And they always said, the Olympic Games has always had trouble with events outside of the stadium. So my commitment to myself was, um, this is going to be flawless. I don't care what it takes, it's going to be flawless. They, they've had a lot of dis disruptive stuff. Now, my, I was interviewed, kind of a strange interview. Should I tell you the story? Okay. <clears throat> um, there may be, maybe there's a hundred premier race directors in the whole world. New York Marathon, you would think of there. Uh, the Beta Breakers in San Francisco, maybe the Honolulu Marathon, maybe Beijing and so forth. They had, they had some real talent. And uh, I decided I would not apply. If they want me, come and get me, baby. <laughs> and, uh, that's tactical because I knew I knew how the, I knew how Peter Hoover thought. He's he's a he's a brilliant game guy, but <laughs> and uh, so um, but fortunately for me, Runners World magazine. I'd been an editor there. I'd written an article about this crazy major that's running around doing this thing years ago. They resurrected it, and uh, I had a couple of major successes just before that. The Patty Hearst thing, I worked on that. So the Hearst newspaper was very favorable towards me. So, uh, um, I got a call to come down for an interview. And then the flight. So I walk into this interview room, and there's about 20 guys in there. And guys I know real well. You know, and uh, so I, I play games with them. What the hell are you doing here? You're not, you're not in the range of consideration. Oh, you're here for the janitor's job, right? And just working on their brain, you know. And <coughs> so uh, anyway, Uvaroff was a top gun. Harry Usher is a second dog. Then there was a director of um, athletics, co-director of athletics. And, and he was a political appointee. So, uh, Ubrov said, uh, Ubrov's got a, his nose is to his eye like this. So he looks at you like this. And it's unnerving if you let it, you know. And I had practiced ahead of time, and I wasn't going to get sucked into that nose crap. And um, so, the moment he pulled that crap, I moved the other way. <laughs> so I could make it even more pronounced. My job is to make them uneasy. You know? And uh, so I said, well, You've already got my resume, and the, I'll go over it. Happy to go over it again. Is there anything in it that you want to elaborate on? I mean, I, I didn't put all the bad stuff in there about me, but uh, I think there's enough there for you to know who I am. Um, I said, um, well, tell us what you know about international affairs. Now, I know the reason for that question is because they want to know if you've been that finesse. And I said, well, I served in three wars, and I've been all over the place, and then, you know, the <laughs> usual bullshit. You know. And I'm laughing and smiling and having a good time. And, uh, uh, what was the other question I asked? Oh, I know. Three questionnaires. He said, you have anything to say to us? And I, yeah, I sure do. I said, there's 20 guys out there, equally or better qualified than me, but none of them have a terrorist background. And if you want, Oh, the fourth question, are you a good team guy? And I said, no, I'm not a good team guy. I'm a leader. If you want a good team guy, pick one of them. You, know? you, want, a, you want somebody to fold up during a terrorism thing, go pick one. But if you want somebody who can handle the job, I'm your guy. And I said, look, I could have planned to catch him with Hawaii. <laughs> That's just what a brassy asshole I am. But it works, you know, because I knew I knew exactly what to do because I was playing with their brain. And you know, you've been in that situation. It's like being a salesman. And Uberoff is smiling at all this, you know. And, and the guy that's the director of athletics, he's he's floored that anybody would be that brace. <laughs> and uh, so anyway, I got to Hawaii. My friend Jim Moberly, he's at West Point, class of '64 guy. Says you got a call from a guy that named Uberoff. <laughs> I said, uh, have you offered me any money? And he said, no, he said, I want you to call him back at the Olympic headquarters. And so I said, okay. And I went over to a paper and I called him. And uh, I was going to call him collect later. <laughs> I thought I was too brushy. <laughs> and uh, so he said, Len, if you want the job, it's yours. And uh, I said, I'm very happy to hear that, sir. He said, uh, when are you going to get here? I said, not for three weeks. I'm on vacation. 
I didn't any bother. Yeah. So me and I had a free ride for almost a year and a half. How did you plan that for that three weeks when you got back? I know you. <laughs> <laughs> well, first of all, uh, um, you, the biggest danger of the games is danger. So I had to assemble a crew of about 15 goons that I trusted. I mean, trust with my life, you know. That were willing to lay on the line for me at the time came. And they, we were not afraid to step in and beat heads because you can't depend on the cops. So I got Bucks one up in Reno, I told you about. And we got, God, we got and great guys. One guy had, had climbed uh, Everest. Those, those kind of guys, you know. A couple of, uh, uh, um, what do you call it, uh, CIA types. But they're good men, guys that, and, and we liked each other, you know. And then I, I figured out the best way logistically to handle it. It's 26 miles from the start to the finish. The finish is only 400 yards, <laughs> and that's where all the people are. You know. But on the course, it could be thousands and thousands and thousands, plus all these media jerks that just think they, you know, they, they own you. And then there was a need to recruit 4,000 people, for volunteers. But the course had to have a mile chief on both sides of the roadway every mile. And then they had to have crew chiefs every 500 feet. And then they had to have a volunteer every 10 feet. For 26 miles. For 26 miles. That's a lot of training. So we assembled them in, into a big hangar in Los Angeles. And we trained, we trained 16,000 people. And, you know, a leader, a great leader, is charismatic. You don't have to like him, but you have to be able to follow him. And if, he, if they think you'll go to the absolute certain death, they'll follow you. But you have to be charismatic. And he has to be enlightened and in touch with the troops. And so you start to lecture out by giving the history of the games, you know, and what the, what the, what, what's the underlying meaning of all this, you know? It's man's struggle against adversity, words like that. The history of the Battle of the Plains of Marathon, what were the statistics? And then you finally say, God damn it, you got 10 feet of territory and it's yours. If you fuck it up, you're in big trouble with me. <laughs> you know, I'm talking to 4,000 people out there. You know? And uh, of course, there's a, this guy up there, a little, little skinny guy like me, you know? But they take it because they know it's backed up for this military stuff. They know a military guy will come through. And of course, I, play, I played on that. And uh, <laughs> when you say to them, you got 10 feet of fucking territory, you better not fuck it up. <laughs> and they say, wow, this guy, and the women in this group. And women don't get any special treatment. You gotta be just as tough as everybody else. You know? humma, 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 humma. And it was funny, as we were, we were on a, we were on a uh, motorcycle going down to the course, leading the, the runners. And when we come by, they would slow this. <laughs> I put my, put my green beret on just, just to harass everybody. And I, I loved insulting my fellow race directors. And then when the race was over, the, the men's race was over, I went out and got on my motorcycle with my wife, not Diana. That's, that's where I met Diana. And drove to the airport, took the key, threw it in the train, called him and said goodbye. And I never went back. Never even picked up my last check. I was done with, and that's, that's my pattern. I'm done with it. I gotta do something else. When I was writing my books, I'm done with the book. Let's do something else. Well, you focused intently for a year and a half. Oh yeah, yeah. I was on it the whole time. I ran that damn course every day, a part of it every day, so I knew every, I, I knew it. Well, for somebody who didn't know the Olympic course, that's 26 miles, covers what area? Started at Santa Monica Junior College and wound up at the Olympic Stadium and wandered all over the place. Uh, and it's a, it, we closed a couple of freeways, you know. I mean, literally closed them down. But that part of the course was, um, that part of the work was, wasn't that hard, knowing the course. What was hard is getting people to under, understand that they got a piece of territory. And I want you to turn your back to the runners and face the crowd because that's where the danger is. And if you can't handle it, we got a, a mile chief on a bicycle who can handle it. And if he can't handle it, the goon squad will come in and they'll take care of the guy that's giving you the trouble and you. There, there, there are consequences for failure to do your work. 
You know it isn't combat. And how, did, how would you have said, how did your crews compare? Compare to? With others, other oh, Olympic teams. We were rated to the top 10% of the entire Olympic family. The first 9% were d dedicated to the administrative people, you know, the, the Duke leaders. And we came out, I got a, I got a $10,000 bonus. Uh, and I was making $6,000 a month. That's not, and a car, and a hotel, and this, and that. <laughs> and Diana was a volunteer. She was my, her best friend was living with my best friend. Well, listen, let me, yeah. so we can tell me about Diana. Because okay. you met her now. Yeah. I'll go with that. Part of this, I, I have to clean up a little. <laughs> a little dust. Oh, no, I need it. Give me a mommy dust. Uh, okay. This is, this is Diana. Diana Trefelli is her maiden name. And a uh, uh, good Italian. Can you tilt this down? Is that better or up? Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Only because we wear. Okay. Anyway, um, I was one of the few times I was working at a desk in the movie games. So usually you're out there chasing people or, you know, any of the things that you do to be a race director. Um, you know, most race directors come up from track and field, they're, they're the coach, you know, and they don't know anything about logistics or administration or command and control. And the beauty of being a soldier, you know more about the command and control and logistics, you know, and you can kick ass and take names and get things done. Anyway, I was sitting at my desk, and I just got through reading the biography of Omar Bradley, one of my favorite, favorite generals. <laughs> and uh, I've always liked just the charming guy. And Diana came by the desk, and she was a, she was the girlfriend of my best friend. Okay. Um, and we had some difficulties with that situation, which had to be settled. And you don't you don't walk away from complex situations if you're if you're a leader. You settle it. You know? And so I did. <laughs> and I, Diana came by and said, what's going on? I said, you tell your lady friend, you know, that uh, we're going to act together. Because I've already taken care of it. <coughs> and um, so, she, and I was reading, reading this biography, and she picked it up and said, what, what's, what's this about? So I said, well, this is a soldier's general. You know? This is a guy that is dearly loved and sometimes hated. And uh, he has many good lessons for life. And certainly in my case, he was a great inspiration to me to me in, in the latter part of my military career. <laughs> yeah. And so if you'd like to read it, she said, yeah, I'll, I'll come to it. I said, no, 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 you don't get the picture, <laughs> sweetie. You either read it or you leave it here. But if you want to read it, I will give it to you and I'll leave it engraved with my name. And the, the Olympic, Olympic motto was as long as, long as the stars are in motion. So I wrote it in the book. We're together as long as the stars are in motion. That was I wasn't making a pass at her. I just because I was married at the time, and Diane had been divorced about thirty years. And uh, so anyway, uh, we began we, we began a friendship. And so I gave her the book, and she said, "Okay, I'll buy you lunch." Now lunch at the Olympic Games was twenty five cents in the Olympic cafeteria. <laughs> Big deal, you know. <laughs> so I said, "Oh, how thoughtful of you." I wonder if you can afford it. They're joking around. So anyway, I went home, and I then my divorce started. And for about a 10-year period, I kept in touch with Diana. And then finally, I started running back and forth down here. And it seemed appropriate that we get married. Um, I mean, it's appropriate is the right word. And, we, and believe me, we don't mess around. We're not that kind of, she's not that kind of a lady. She's a real lady. And um, I could see where... She could benefit from my strength, and I could benefit from her, her kindness, and it's been that way. Like I mentioned to you earlier, we've, we've been married now 11 years, almost 11 years. We have never had an argument, and we have never raised our voices in this house, and we never will. So we've got the, got the right formula. She's been a great supporter, and she's a good Army wife, a very good Army wife. The people in the military, like the Sergeant Major Lily, love her. And, uh, Medal of Honor guy, John Caviani, thinks she's the greatest thing since bread, you know, uh, in terms of for me. And she is, she is. And the big thing for me was, would her sons accept me? And they have, and would my kids 
except for them, except for they adore her, you know. They call this house Grandma's house. <laughs> so it did turn out, you know, we've been lucky. I've been lucky. No, I've been lucky. We've worked at it. <laughs> and she's a proper balance for me. Because you see, you, you know enough of me to you know that, that, that I come on really strong. And oftentimes too strong. Can I put this down? Yes, please. Thank you. She's a very good balance. And uh, she's a no bullshit lady out there. She doesn't take any crap from anybody. She's she's been good in that respect. She's was a little timid when we first started, but boy, she she lays into you. If you're in the army environment, you better look out because she'll cut you to shreds. If you step out of line. Well, when you you decided to retire at 87, mm -hmm. and that's been a few weeks now, uh, and you had been writing for some time. Uh, yeah. Tell me about how you began an interest in writing and how it developed because you you did a lot of things before you became more recognized as a writer mm. and, and tell me how that developed and because that's a whole other part of your life yeah creativity is a is a uh, well, any, anybody who works in film knows what creative <laughs> i mean you're, you're being creative in this process it, it's a joy unto itself it doesn't mean it's not without its sorrows because there are some bitter disappointments. I always knew I wanted to be a writer, which is the reason I pointed toward journalism. But when I go to high school, I write these beautiful little stories, you know, and, and uh, I knew I was good, you know. I mean, but I never could say that to anybody. That's, Damn, I'm good, you know. <laughs> be too embarrassing. And uh, it took from the side of the outside to tell me that I was good. I had an experience when I was going to college, working in the school newspaper and all that kind of stuff. And I, I've been writing all my life anyway. Wonderful little vignettes. Because the military is larger than life. There's all kinds of stuff to write about. Yes. Um, I had a chance to meet and, and, and interview John Steinbeck, which was a real eye opener out there. This Nobel laureate. And, and I went back and looked at his stories again. And he said he, he was just a storyteller. And he is. He's a very good storyteller. Well, I took a little different, th little different approach. Um, First of all, I, w I want to write something technically th th that would stand. Not big, but that would stand. I also wanted to write something that was very, very creative, but also built around uh, fact. Maybe even almost like an epilogue. And that's a, that's, that's a hard manuscript to manage. Um, I wanted to try my hand at poetry. But I didn't want to do the usual rhyme crap, you know. And, um, and I wanted to be a, a working journalist on a newspaper and a magazine. And that's a, that's a lot of stuff, you know. And uh, so, <coughs> yeah, yeah, you, you, know how, you know how you cook an elephant? First you get a frying pan. <laughs> that's me. I went out and got the frying pan. And I, you know, I never doubted that, that I, I had the talent. Never. I've never sat down with a blank typewriter. You know, I mean, it just didn't happen. And that's that's not vanity. That's just a practical fact of the matter. That a seventy-six-year-old man could sit down and say, "Damn, you're good," <laughs> and but you got to put this stuff out. So, I made up my mind. I was going to go to a, how to get establish a goal. What's the path to the goal, and what are the things in the way? And in writing, it's the ideal way to do it. I read about Homer um, when he wrote the Iliad. He would have stacks of stuff by subjects. And he would, whatever mood it hit him, he'd pick up the stack and write on that stack and put that stack down. So I said, I'm going to try that. You know, I'm, I'm going to use manila envelopes. And so I took a whole bunch of manila, manila envelopes and pinned them to the wall, and I would start working on this manuscript. And I didn't know where the damn thing was going to go. You know, Creativity can't be scheduled. You just got to create and let it come, you know? And uh, um, so that became very important to me, this first book, the major episode. It was written about an athletic event, but it goes through history from 1896. I read every newspaper, every page, from four papers a day from 1896 to 1978 at night in a San Francisco library until I was so fatigued. But I learned something out of that. At night in the San Francisco Library, 
all the bums come in, stay out the cold, and they want to tell me the story. They want to tell their story. There are more goddamn stories out there. You can do. I didn't have to create anything. I that's one thing I learned. And then I learned that uh, it's harder to write a good sentence than it is to write a paragraph. It's harder to write a good paragraph than to write a page. You know? And I got that from Tim from Pope. So I worked at it. I worked hard. And um, so I wrote this 500 page manuscript. He got somebody to type it for me, rewrote it several times, polished it. Made an appointment with William, who I thought was William Randolph Hearst. It turned out to be Randolph Averson Hearst. And uh, took the manuscript in and said, You gave me an appointment. <laughs> How can you be that, that forward? <laughs> and, uh, so I uh, gave it to him in his office. His office is like this, it's no, there's no desk, just chairs in it. And um, he, brought his guy, he brought his guy in by the name of Silverman, who was a kind of a hawk. I knew I was going to have a hard time with this guy, <laughs> and uh, in the same same way, how do I how do I calculate it? What do I do with this guy? He's going to work me over, and uh, little fat, roly poly guy. So uh, I sat down with him, away from hers. I said, uh, "God, you look like shit. You know, you're too fat. Are you Jewish? You know, of course he was, and I, and people think I'm Jewish, so I'm, but you know, of course I'm a Catholic." I said, "How come you let him work me over? You know." I just put him on the defense, and all the, la, la, la. and so anyway, they took the book, and within a month they said they'd publish it, and uh, it was out twenty thousand copies first week. What was the title of your book? The Human Race, but it's a it's a masterpiece of, of mix. it's a storyline about a race, and it deals with about three hundred people during the course of their lives over a period of almost seventy five years. It's like a train going down the track. You get off at the station, get back on, go to the mission, get off. So that, that vehicle is the path to the goal. Okay? The goal is to get it published, get it read. <coughs> um, his, history playing a role. What's going on in the city of San Francisco? What's going on in California? What's going on in the nation? How does that affect these people? World War I comes along and these, these wonderful athletes are drafted, some were killed. Pathos, where are they buried, you know, and so forth. Anyway, so, and um, Diana keeps insisting that I write more about it. I said, well, now I have to read the book. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, Diana, you know, you don't get the picture. It's done, it's done. You go on to the next thing, the next challenge. I mean, I mean how, how, how often do I got to be a second lieutenant, you know? <laughs> so anyway, uh, that was the first thing. Then a guy called me and said, I want to do a book on how to make money as a college student. And that's a little bizarre, you know? And uh, would you like to write a couple of chapters? I said, hell no, I'll write the whole book. You know? So I sat down and I wrote this book, How to Make Money as a College Student. And it's a good book, you know, because it, kids read it. Okay? Um, then the uh, next one was Parents Teaching the Children to Swim, Teaching Johnny to Swim is the name of the book. <laughs> so, that's the same thing, you know? It's a how-to book. And writing how-to books is not necessarily a bad way to make money, you know? And I wasn't interested in the money. I would detach from it. I don't care about the copyright. I, none of that bothered me. I just wanted to get it out. Then I went to Thailand, and I have a friend over there, Tanit Kong Mont. He's a, he's a professor of physical education. And that's the National College of Education. And it's, a, he, it's like the Harvard of Thailand. And we, did, we went together and did a book on survival. And uh, it was aimed primarily at the military. And I said, no, let's do this a little bit. Let's just talk about survival for everybody, like snake bites and drowning and, you know, you know, and, and, and make it gory. You know? And get some gory pictures. And, um, and we did. And it sold, too. It's in Thai. But it's, that's our book. You know. and I, I keep laughing with, with Diana because she doesn't get the idea that uh, uh, um, you, you put it behind you. You go on. And you have to go on. You can't. You can't stagnate. You can't keep talking all, all the time about what you did in the war, Daddy. You know that's dead. And if you want an experience, go out to the veterans hospital, sit next to some guy, and say, "You know me, guy? Well, yeah, I'm, I was in the Marine Corps. Oh, where were you?" And then out comes the story. And he'll keep you there all day telling you the story. He's reliving his past over and over and over. Endless tape. Not me. Um, that's the reason I went to see Father, Father Damien's grave. I'm, I'm burning to go there. 
is a lesson there for me. You know? So then I got hired by Runner's World to do, to, to do columns for world publications, which include Runner's World. And I always had a great time. Hist I am interested in sports history and sports literature, not sports writing. And sports literature is almost always built around pathos and failure. What do you remember about the wide world of sports? That guy coming down the hill and falling on his ass? That's the story. It's not Mary Lou Reston, whoever it was, or the little girl that hurt her ankle, you know, or so forth. It's Muhammad Ali's attraction is he's got Parkinson's. It's pathos, you know. Um, Lance Armstrong has got cancer. That's the story. Not that he rides a bicycle fast. So I'm interested in that. Sports history, God, there's so much stuff out there that hasn't been touched. I found, historically, a race that was run from San Francisco to Grants Pass, Oregon, by Indians, 1927. And I got the pictures out of it. Out of, out of, I found this goddamn stuff just by wandering around the archives. And so it's fun for me to, and then I got, I got hired by the, the newspaper um, in uh, San Mateo, the Times, which is a fairly large newspaper. <laughs> Yeah, and I did a daily column on, uh, which eventually became a weekly column because it was too hard, on out outdoor stuff, mostly running. And boy, I, could I unload these wonderful little vignettes that wouldn't make a full story, but make a good newspaper. So I had that column for 10 years. 10 years. Okay. <laughs> uh, and and how, how has that manifested itself now? You've been retired for, what, thir you know, 15, 16 years. Mm -hmm. uh, that's become a more important part of your life now. Tell me about how that's done. Well, you know, it's easy to be smug about your ability, and it's dangerous for me to say, I'm good, I'm damn good. Uh, so i got to get somewhere in between that, being smug and, and uh, being real, realistic for my answer. Um, I didn't ask God or whoever created me to be smart or to be creative. It just happened. You know? And I'm blessed that I do have that gift. And again, I can't take credit for it. But I can be its custodian. And I have a responsibility to take that talent and to use it wisely. And as, as solidly as I can, focus it on where I should go with it, or it should, it, it should go with me. It's saying that, um, I have the ability to think. Um, I know the I know the, the method of thinking. And I use that, and I muse over what I should be doing with that talent. What should I write about? Now, I can be a very cute writer and be clever. And lots of people are clever. And that's kind of artificial, but people do read that stuff. And I could then write cleverly uh, and uh, make money at it. And most of the war novels. And you know the kind of people I'm talking about, especially those who writing, continue writing the same kind of trash. That's okay. I mean, but I don't have to do that. I could pick something more serious because I tend to be on the serious side of things. Or I can go philosophical, and you know the kind of stuff that comes out of that. It gets so profound that only the writer knows what he's talking about. So I had to, had to search out what I what I wanted. Right now, my interest has been for several years. I'm very much interested in the military history of the Philippines and the military history of Hawaii. And I'm not talking about the Cowboys and Indians now. I'm talking about uh, the uh, 
the, the lead up groups, like the Negritos in the Philippines, the episode of Magellan and Lafu Lafu, um, the, going back and something like um, I heard that there were 300,000 warriors in the Philippines um, before 1898 when the Spanish-American War turned. So I have, a, I have an interest historically in that. Now within, the, within all that, there are some characters that uh, interest me. Aguinaldo is one. Um, Bonifacio is another one. Aguinaldo inter interests me because he's somewhere between a crook and a general. I'm not sure where, but the, the more I read about it, the more controversial the guy is. And yet he he's, he's, would make a very, very good subject to expand on. I went to the Philippine bookstore a few days ago trying to find something to meet it. Well, there's nothing, there's nothing there, you know? I got a history of the Philippine Islands and, uh, uh, and there's hardly nothing there. I, I got another little book on the, the list of the prominent Filipinos. He's really worth two paragraphs. So I have a, almost a compulsion. I want to dig on this guy a little more, you know? And because uh, I think probably, he, maybe he's, I think he's a rascal, but I'm not sure, but certainly he's worthy of a full-blown biography. On the Philippine sun on the flag, there are eight rays, and they represent the, the, uh, the communities that rose up against the Spanish. Um, and if you read about that, you get this view that all Filipinos were heroes, all George Washington's, like in, in, in World War II, all the Filipinos were guerrillas, you know. I don't think that's true. I think probably there's somewhere there's a lot of distortions in it, and it deserves to be faced with the truth. It's like talking about General MacArthur. My feeling about him is not very popular, but yet he is adored in the Philippines. So why? The Philippine personality is such that they have to have a hero? Um, so that's one area that I'm particularly interested in right now. Um, I'm also now trying to find something in sports literature something could be sports literature that talks more wisely and intelligently about the spirit of activity. Um, Tom Fatko is a professor down at San Jose State and he writes about uh, sports psychology. Everybody's writing about sports psychology, in particular him, but that's not what I'm interested in. I'm to, there's something that goes on with an athlete like that uh, uh, is unique and different and has not been articulated properly. Billy Mills, a great American 10,000 meter runner, Indian Marine Corps guy, is a friend of mine. And uh, we went running one time, as a matter of fact, from the Belmont Hills. And uh, we're running along. I, I, I dog along maybe at, in those days, about a 7.30 pace. And Billy could probably knock off a 4.10 four pace. Anyway, we're running along and it's sun, sunset, the fog's coming in and uh, on this trail. and. We're just BSing back and forth, and things got kind of quiet. We were out there pretty far. It was getting cold, but I had no shirt on. And uh, we were going to turn around and go back. And so I said, let's just stop for a second. So we did. And he said, Len, you know, there's a legend that the Indian will lead the white man to civilization. And I said, Billy, you're going right over my head. What are you talking about? And he says, and he pointed to the fog and the trees and, and he said, this is civilization. I thought, damn it, why couldn't I have thought that? Why couldn't I have created that, that thought in my brain? What is it that I'm missing? And of course the next question is, what is everybody else missing? Why is it that we worship at the troth of uh, Muhammad Ali over this pathetic, this pathetic ending and tolerate a guy like George Foreman. What is it that, that's there? So it's, it's that spiritual part of sport. And I've coined a phrase often that sport um, replicates man's struggle against adversity. Man's struggle against adversity. Well, in a kind of a safe way it does. But I've been on runs of 100 miles or so, and I'll tell you, it ain't, it ain't, it ain't safe doing that. <laughs> so what is it that drives a guy like me, a little old me, I'm a skinny little shrimp, to do that kind of stuff? What is the spiritual quality of sport? Um, 
it's not heroics, because that anybody can do that. Anybody can do that. There's something more, like a little kid running on a playground in a hundred yard dash against his classmate. What's going on there? It, uh, so I need to spend a little more time thinking about that. I'm sure I'll come up with something, but that's the kind of area I'd like to write. Unfortunately, that that's a Reader's Digest type thing. You know, it's not long enough, and it's certainly not challenging enough. Um, I love the historical aspects of stuff uh, that consumes a lot of time in the writing part. Maybe where you, where you can really flesh it out. And I've got a couple couple of good ones that I'm almost finished with. One is the origins of marathoning in North America. It's a full blown piece. It took me two years to write it, and I've been sitting on my desk for two years. Why haven't I been willing to put it out? I simply was not ready uh, to lay this beautiful piece on the, in front of slobs. This is the way I am. You know? That doesn't mean I'm vain now, please don't misunderstand. It's not vanity, it's just a practical matter of facing who I am. And so you're now here as a special ops. Yeah. Uh, right after a break, Cowboys and Indians. <laughs> no, I think probably uh, somewhere in my life uh, I must have been exposed to and accepted the idea that the military is a noble profession and that I was setting myself aside. In fact, I know that it is a noble. And I, pursuing noble purpose is one of the, one of the lines in the um, the, the armed regulations on decorations and awards are uh, given for a pursuit of noble purpose. So I must have had something happen to kind of a, not a transition, but a, a osmosis, I guess, where the thought that what I was doing was so worthwhile that I should continue in spite of all the difficulties. And there were lots and lots of times when I wanted to say, kiss my ass, Uncle Sam. Um, the... Uh, most of the injustices that happened to me and my other friends are, are man-made. I mean, God didn't strike me. <laughs> uh, the, uh, there I had a couple of really nasty situations where I got a, where I really got into personalities that were terrible. But <clears throat> I guess I clung to automatically without even being aware of it that uh, it was noble. And, you know, when you're an army kid growing up, you are surrounded with stories about the past and these great heroes and, and you start reading and you know and of course I started reading all the good stuff <laughs> you know like like uh, the uh, well not, not that but the biographies of some of the early people and probably got inspired like wow General Peyton March he's the chief of staff man wow wow <laughs> and uh, our Joe Swing's family goes back to the pre-revolutionary war. Hmm, I gotta do that. <laughs> and uh, yeah, you know, when I go to the, these award ceremonies and the daughters of the American Revolution come up with their medals and craft the God, how pitiful this is. Where is their pride? That may be another reason, just proud. I like being, like, like looking the part. It's terrible to say that the vanity drove me on. I want more medals. <laughs> So, you know, we're the only nation, only country, 
that has a written document, the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence, that were well thought out and that have survived. Even the Magna Carta doesn't get anywhere near us. And so that's starting with that, the kids grow up with that idea that we're unique. And of course, the military has always been, everybody's enamored by the uniforms. And when you're a kid growing up, you play cops and robbers. And, and so uh, you, when you get into it like that, eventually you're going to come to the point that you've got to do some real thinking about what is this all about, you know? And what am I doing with my life? Is this something that I, w I don't want to go to jump, don't want to go jump school or go to school? Or I want to go to CBR? To, you know, what are the things, opportunities that are being offered me? And then what are the difficulties in a way? Um, I think probably uh, it's kind of a combination of flash and dash. That is, you, you look at all that stuff and say, boy, I want to be one of those guys. You know? I want to be a hero. And you don't know what this, you have the slightest idea what that means, you know? but you want to do it. You know, the, the thing that's going on now, everybody's got a medal for something. <laughs> and uh, the, uh, it's, like the, the combat infantry badge is a big thing in the military. And of course, everybody wants to get it. And now all of a sudden, we've got a bunch of 19-year-old kids that get the combat infantry badge for doing what? Is that equivalent to the combat infantry badge of World War II? I don't know, but you know they want it. So they get caught up now, can they sustain it? I don't think I've ever had a period in my military career that was boring. That take one, one period that was boring. Kind of like everything was fun, you know? Even when it got hard. <laughs> But, uh, but there are times in my life I thought, this is crazy. I'm out here pulling targets you know, in, the, in the cold and rain in Fort Ord. <laughs> what am I doing here? You know, This is not the army I, I joined. But I still get hooked on the parades and, and wards and decorations. I've been known to be go overboard on ceremonies. Um, I mean, I, I, I just can't go to a dinner party without giving a speech. You know? <laughs> but uh, I guess it's it's a it's a structured way of life where you know how the outcome's going to be. In civilian life, I have not found a single thing where you get the respect, the comfort, the prestige of being a soldier. And when you go in civilian life and you are acting out your part as, as a soldier, even there you don't get anything. I mean, I, just, I find it crazy that people have no idea. I sit down and they start calling me Sarge, you know, it's just a joke, you know. And, uh, but of course, I don't let that happen. If you try it with me, you find out real quick who I am. You know? um, the, uh, but in the military, it's all, it, the very first lesson you learn in the military, the very first course you get is military courtesy, right? And so you, you, you're growing up in an atmosphere where everything's so structured, even how to say sir, you know? And they don't require you to salute without you knowing what you're doing. And it's that, that uh, it's elevated man's behavior to a very high level, I think. Um, of course, I have the good fortune of coming out of a tradition of being a fourth generation soldier where I have perhaps even a greater appreciation for it. And I see the failings my right and left. I particularly see it in the reserve components where, whew, wow, <laughs> they got a ways to go. We got a ways to go too in the regular so Look at this thing at the Air Force Academy. I mean, how could that happen? How could they cover it up? They had to cut their ears off. You know, I, I, of course, I'm very fond of West Point. The other day, I decorated a kid that's uh, in the ROTC with the, special, with the Special Forces Medal, and that's big time, you know? And he was accepted at West Point, and he was leaving the next day. And that, why that gets pretty cool, you know? This kid, American high school kid, uh, got the Special Forces Medal and he's going to West Point. I mean, boy, there's something right about that, you know? And that particular school, Valencia High School, they really go all out on this military stuff. You gotta get away from form, and get to content. And one of the problems with the reserve components, they're preoccupied with, fo with form and not content. They talk about being soldiers, they don't treat their soldiers like soldiers. I mean, your situation is difficult. Don't, don't, don't think I'm mad at the reserve components. I'm just making an observation. Mm. No, I, I think that that's a pretty much general health mm. concept that where uh, for some reason that seems to permeate those, uh, those two uh, areas. Uh, the last area I wanted to explore was uh, not only this new life you have, 
But tell me about you, your family. Now, you, you had a number of children. Mm -hmm. uh, you have a second family mm -hmm. and some stepchildren. Uh, it's a new life for you. What's, what's the last 11 years been like? <laughs> oh, I did. I've had a great time. I have had a great time. Um, well, the kids all have all done extraordinarily well, far beyond my expectation. And in each case, they did it by themselves. You know, my kids have never, never borrowed money from me, nor have they ever called me sir. Interesting. There's, there's some kind of stuff in there I don't quite see. But, uh, Timmy, the FBI agent, is uh, um, right at the top of the heap, yet he was dyslexic. He had a tough time getting through the academy. Um, he had a tough time getting his master's in Hawaii. Um, Bonnie, in drug enforcement agency, is now married to uh, a guy in diplomatic corps who's in diplomatic security down in Honduras. Just his second assignment. He was in the Philippines before. Um, both dangerous assignments. Um, Leah is a nutritionist. Uh, she got a fellowship at Stanford on death and dying. And uh, she's doing, she's, she's a little ill right now, but she's bright, she's a bright kid, got a real brain on her. Very conservative in her approach to nutrition. Diabetic to top of it all. Um, that brings me down to um, well, Bonnie's uh, D DEA guy, lady. Dodi is a school teacher. Matter of fact, she moved from Belmont, where she was at now, down in Pasadena. Um, she has a daughter who is a college graduate who wants to go into into uh, acting. Whether or not she's going to be successful or not, who knows? But not like the rest of the kids, they're going to they're all going to do it. Little Scotty uh, is up in Northern California. He's, a, he's kind of a self-made contractor. He likes being up there in the boondocks. Um, he's a um, He's a, he's a step to step son. Oh, Jeff. Jeff had a hard time adjusting, and he, he was the most valuable athlete when he was going to Carlin and wrestling. Um, but now he seems to be getting on his feet and going right, right, right direction. He's a surfer, he's a good one. Um, but they're all surfers. <laughs> but Wallach's not a surfer. Then uh, Diana's kids, Steve is a stockbroker type, a financial guy, and um, way up high in his firm and he lives in Connecticut and they're very wealthy and they're you know they're just nice guys got two kids they're nice kids and his wife is a sweetheart just a sweetheart little kind of a girl from Indiana you know grew up in Indiana he went to Notre Dame not Notre Dame California Notre Dame Notre Dame um, and Scott the other Scott's out here in the coast he's also in the financial thing and uh, He's got three kids, and uh, they live in, in a very well-to-do thing. Uh, but you look at them, we don't, have to, we don't worry about them. You know, they're, they're good kids. We don't worry about them financially either. Uh, the, uh, that's a, a big boon. And we've got a kind of an informal agreement. I don't particularly like traveling to the East. So when Diana wants to go there, go. I went last year with her and uh, froze my ass off for two weeks in Connecticut. God. And they live in Greenwich, you know, and Greenwich is a real uppity town, and I don't, I don't know just for <laughs> I mean, I'd rather be down in Mexico in the tea water. I'm not more that kind of guy. Um, she's, we're going up north this coming weekend to, to run the Dipsy race, which is a 14-miler for Billy Goats, huh? And uh, we'll, we'll see the kids, and, uh, but just briefly. Well, how would your life? Remarried again, Oh, God. She, Diana is, a, is an angel. She's an angel. We, without ever even talking about it, we got some kind of informal rules. For, for, yeah, we didn't, we, for, before we got married, we, we played it straight because there are children involved and their reputations involved. And, and uh, we both wanted to protect each other. That's, a, that's unusual in the modern marriage. Right? Um, a lot of unwritten stuff. Uh, we split the expenses right down the middle. Um, she keeps her bank account. I keep mine, but I keep my checkbook so she, so she can see it. 
I never ask questions about her past. She can ask me anything she wants. And, um, and she's good about that. The, uh, there's a high level of trust, very high level of trust. I was concerned that when we got married that she could, could maybe couldn't handle the Army traditions. You know? And uh, I mean, it's traditional, like get out of the car when the plane retreat. You know? uh, it's a minor little thing, but I, I wanted to be sure she had a good, solid respect for it. But she's fine. If she gets to the commissary and if somebody waitress waits on her improperly, she nails it. And that's the way she'd be. Um, she's very courteous to everybody in the military, but if an MP stops her and gives her, gives her mouth, he's going to get her right back. You know? <laughs> so she's, she's got, walks that delicate line. Um, she, with my military friends who are slobs, she lets them know real quick that they're slobs. You know? um, she doesn't tolerate any foolishness. Command Sergeant Major, every time he sees her, he'll be over, he's big, you know, he'll pick her up, you know, and carry her around, you know, and she's got that charisma with, this, with these people. Everybody's very respectful of her. Not because she's my wife, but it's just, that's, that's Diana. Um, my rank, my long distance running days are pretty much gone, so I escort her in the car on the bike where she does the, the long train miles, uh, encourage her to continue. Um, we, uh, I'm not a big cook anymore, but about twice a week I get in there and make Chinese fried rice or something like that that she loves. And uh, we don't, I don't eat that much, so she's easy to cook for me. I mean, much like you had today. She understands. She understands. Um, I, if I sit her down and say, I want to talk to you about this award ceremony that's coming, I want you there. <laughs> I, I don't want to go alone. And I see it for a moment, she's thinking, oh my God, not another one of these days. <laughs> and she still go, still go. Um, she came in the other day, and I've got this one ceremony planned for her 50th anniversary, 50th OCS graduation. And she said, aren't you being a little bit too elaborate on this? And of course, my first re reaction is, none of your goddamn business what I'm doing. Uh, this is my show. And I, I said, no. I, we could do it the easy way, and it's damn general. It doesn't, he's getting kind of gun shy. Uh, and so I said, Diana, it has nothing to do with those people. It's me. It's just for me. I'm doing this for me. I want a nice ceremony for me, and we're going to do it this way. And maybe I'm being too sharp with you, but it's going to be that way anyway. So anyway, uh, and she could have got pissed off, or she might have been pissed off. I don't know. Uh, she never voiced it. Uh, so it, it's that compromise. She says, uh, I want to paint the house yellow. Like, I'm colorblind. Right? <laughs> so, oh, that's a wonderful idea, Diana, even if I think it's lousy. You know? <laughs> and uh, um, what was the other thing? Something came up about, oh, yes, yeah, she wants to get a new toilet. And she's talked about that particular toilet a hundred times and tiled the floor. And this, uh, I thought to myself, okay, my job is to say, yes, that's a wonderful idea, Diana. And even though I'm not the least bit interested, I've got to show interest, you know. And if it gets out of hand and she's not showing interest, I'll tell her, show some interest. I'm, you know, I had to give a speech, a Memorial Day speech at the cemetery. And it's the second time they've invited me. And I have very strong feelings about people giving speeches at cemeteries. And it's, it's a great opportunity to, to relieve a lot of grief if you do it right. And so I worked on a speech for maybe two weeks, got it just right. You know? And as, as I thought, it was long, half an hour speech, but I knew from my writing that I could hit it on the head and hold their attention. Man, I had them crying. Because <laughs> the point was, how do you relieve the grief? You know, Don't grieve about the situation. Take some pride in what your husband did or your son did, that, that he's, he's, he's immortal. He stepped off the battlefield and became immortal. Do you understand immortality? <laughs> you know, hammering away these people and uh, raising my voice. And uh, I thought to, my, thought to myself, gee, you know, this is such a gift I'm giving. It's not that I'm so good, but I know what to do about grief. Because my mother died in an army hospital. My father died from wounds in, in World War II from North Africa. My brother was killed in Belgium. And my little brother uh, died in childbirth. And my nephew, halfway through his life, 
and was just died. And my sister dies in a, you know, somewhere. So I know a lot about grief, you know, a lot about grief. Um, so I, I want to communicate that. So I'm, I'm, I'm telling Diana this, this speech, and let me, this is what I'm trying to do. And then I thought to myself, no, I'm not going to tell her what I want to do. I'm going to read it to her and see if she reacts. And she reacted the way I thought it was. And of course, I walk away from the cemetery thinking, man, I have done good. I have done something good. With the little talent that I have, I've still done something good. And that's my mission in life, to try to do something good. Real simple, but that's my motto. Uh, you guys a very good uh, theme to permeate. Mm -hmm. Either lows or highs. <laughs> well, I always want to be a general, you know, uh, and I hungered after that. I get always working towards it, but I got, I got, I got a, I antagonized a lot of people, and will continue to antagonize a lot of people. And uh, in spite of the fact that I know you have to be gracious and kind, I, I wasn't going to acquiesce to their bullshit. You know, they either had to accept my worth and value and my brains. Are tell me to kiss off and punish me. And they did. They, I got held up several times. Um, second thing, I, I wish I would have been able to have commanded a brigade or a battalion just to see what it felt like. <laughs> uh, but I didn't get that chance, but that's not, 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 a, that's not a real low. Um, level of trust. I don't want to ever ever be in a situation again where I wasn't trusted. And when somebody challenge, challenges me about my decorations and awards, you better be ready for a counterattack. I had a situation at the Rudy, Rudy Hernandez chapter where this one guy, I was wearing a, I was wearing my greens and the unit decorations, I wear nine. I know I wear, wear nine. No, ten, nine, nine. And it's something like, in those days there were maybe ten. One of them I wasn't wearing. Okay? And this guy, and you know, you know this guy, uh, challenged me about how come you have nine? You know, there are only ten. And I thought, what's wrong with this guy? And uh, well, it turned out that I had kind of said to him, you can't wear <coughs> a military green jacket cut off like an Eisenhower jacket. You can't do that. And you cannot wear federal buttons on a state uniform. And there is a ritual you go through in a burial ceremony that you absolutely have to adhere to it perfectly. There's no room for you know some of this crap. And I've been very blunt with them about that. I actually had to talk to the whole group. And I said, I hate sloppy. Um, manual of arms. Anyway, this guy challenged me. So I said something to the effect, well, it's like this. You and I will meet again and we'll discuss it, but in the meantime, you better be prepared to finish your course of action. And uh, so I said, uh, and so he tried to give me some shit, so I said, we'll just turn it over to the FBI. Okay? Well, of course, about and of course, the guys in the, the chapter didn't come, to, did not come to my defense, and they should have. That's about that, that business of loyalty. They're all playing it safe, and to me, including Rudy. That's when I knew he was really, really, really weak. So I did turn it over to the FBI, and within a week, the guy was had to apologize in public. I didn't ask him to apologize in public. He decided to be better. <laughs> we got that FBI stuff, and, and I did. I actually brought the FBI guy in and sat down with. Uh, Rudy and me and him and I was disappointed that Rudy didn't didn't rise to the occasion. I should have known better. Then in another meeting, this one guy got up in the middle of a conversation I was having. Said, "Did you did you really earn all those?" 
<laughs> I thought, what, 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 what is this? This is crazy. Then I let myself into that thing. And I said, uh, well, about the same way you earned your bad conduct discharge. And I opened up the door, you know, and, and it was overkill, but he had it coming. <laughs> and I never saw him again after that. And uh, that happened. And again, those guys didn't come to my defense. And it was the third time, same situation. What the hell was it? Oh, I know. No, the only one times about being challenged. I wanted to bring in Bill X line. And one other guy, prominent person, as honorary members of the chapter. Um, what hell? Because they had done. Bill Exline was the former president of the of the Airborne. Anyway, and I wanted to vote. Now, every guy in this group that, that we were working with has all been decorated as a result of my going behind the scenes and pulling strings to get their, you know. DD 214 or no, I still got them what they wanted. And uh, one guy surprised me because after I got him the Bronze Star, <coughs> he wanted the Bronze Star V. And uh, so I got the Sergeant Major saying, go tell this asshole. <laughs> He's lucky to get the Bronze Star. And I got it for merit, not for, not for, not for heroism. Because uh, the guy had technically earned it. He was in World War II, got the combat infantry badge, and he was entitled. It's an automatic thing. So all I had to do was simply update his thing, but I wasn't going to give him a V under any conditions. <laughs> and uh, so I thought that he would come to the rescue of all people after I got him his bronze star. And he'd get the green. So anyway, they voted against bringing these guys in. And I said, that's for me. I, I, I've said over and over again, I will not do another goddamn thing for you people unless you do something nice for somebody else. And if you don't do something nice for somebody else, I won't help you. And uh, so I left. So that would be some of the valley. What are some of the special peaks in your office? Oh boy, there's lots of them. Fifth jump, <laughs> get those wings, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. How you mentioned about that now. Hmm? What does that really mean to you? Oh man, I'm afraid of heights. I'm definitely afraid of heights. I had to, you know, get this old theory if you fall off the horse, get back on. And it doesn't work that way. <laughs> You're still just as scared. So, I was, I was frightened, very frightened at heights. And uh, I showed the picture of this one guy that we let all flew out one or, one or two together. And um, anyway, the first jump was, wasn't that difficult. And because uh, Richie, Richie was behind me kicking my ass anyway. So, but as, when, you, when you're coming down with a parachute, the ground comes up to you. You don't go down to the ground, it, just, it rushes up to you. I thought, man, that's cool. <laughs> and all of a sudden, I'm on the ground getting, and bouncing all over the place. <laughs> I should have paid attention to that instructor. You know, what else you got to tell me? So the second and third were a little rough. Fourth, I was afraid I would get, get killed. The fifth one, I finally got the wings. <laughs> and I never have to get in this damn bear plane again. Of course, they didn't know I could be assigned of an airborne unit. And uh, so that was a big thrill. Big, big thrill. Um, you know the old saying, you're either airborne or you're shit. <laughs> the, the, the airborne fraternity is, is really quite good. Most people are not afraid of jumping. I am. That was a, one of the peaks. When I got commissioned, I am an officer and gentleman by act of Congress. I am a commissioned officer in the United States Army. And daddy, don't you ever forget it, because I am it. And uh, then, um, you ever hear of the Order of Chamori? Um, I, was, I was given the Order of Chamori. Uh, and that was a big, very extraordinary, I didn't expect it. Mention what it is for people who don't know what it is. The Order of Chamori, the Chamori people are uh, primarily Guamanians, <coughs> and uh, they have, um, going back centuries, even for the Spanish, they developed, uh, as, as all island, island countries developed, their own orders of uh, awards, like the Order of Kralakau and whatever. Each, each island country has their. Well, this is the ancient order of Chamori, which goes back pre-government when they would award, the, a warrior was called a Chamori, and that was the award, the, the verbal. And so for me, that was just, I thought, I got something unusual. <laughs> Where's the ribbon? <laughs> uh, then, uh, let's see, what was the, the uh, oh, when the Korean thing started uh, at the Korean uh, party, no, I wasn't Korean. Where the hell was that? Oh, Queen Sirikit of, 
Thailand and, and King Bumipo uh, cited me and they don't give out medals to foreign men, but they gave silver boxes. And I got this silver box from the Queen. From the Queen, you know. I thought, man, this is this is cool. This is really cool. I am being singled out by the Queen. <laughs> and uh, uh, Bumiful was, was very, very gracious. My Olympic introduction um, got a, got four thousand people applauding me. You know, stand up, and that was very. very it, it's not the, not so much the, the fact that we had ended it; we were successful. They're recognizing that I was the leader. Same with the Vader Breakers uh, when. I was it with it for seven years. I took it from failure to 125,000 people. That's the largest sporting event in the world. <laughs> and I did it. And I, it, I actually was running the race myself. I came across it, came around the final finish line and saw the finish line and, and all those 125,000 people going through smoothly and getting their drinks and having a good time. And I did that. Nobody else knows it but me. I did it. I'm just another running face in it, but I pulled that off. And uh, so that was a high one. Military wise, um, friends I've made, I made some wonderful friends. General Berkman is, has always been a mentor, a kind man. He became the chief executive for the Reserve Policy Board, which is all services, had been the chief of Army Reserve. Um, I've been his deputy when we were on active duty. Um, I got the oh, you know, I got awarded the Japanese uh, Special Forces wings, which is not too bad. <laughs> and uh, I got the Philippine oh, I got the Philippine national wings from uh, what's his name uh, himself, uh, Marcos. It got a lot of a lot of uh, jewelry recognition you know, that I could wear, and. Uh, I got caught up in it for a while. Oh, the, the big one, though, the big one, the giant one is, this is the giant one, Secretary of Army Award, Distinguished Member of the Regiment. And that, uh, I mean, you don't get any higher than that. If that's your unit saying you have arrived and the Secretary of Army is awarding it, and the Secretary of the Army doesn't stick his finger up your ass very well. <laughs> so, uh, I guess then my kids, I used to go to the office club with my kids in, on, in Japan, we were living in Japan after mass, you know, and we'd go in and I'd be at the, the uniform, I'd be here, and my wife, and then all these little ducklings behind me, you know, and we'd go to this table, which, which was always held for us, the biggest table of the club, and General White would come in, and uh, he'd make, this guy was a great general, a three-star, he'd come up and he'd say, uh, Look at Timmy. He said, "Timmy, did you brush your teeth this morning?" <laughs> and if I get down to Bonnie, and Bonnie's a little little girl, he says, he says, "Bonnie, did you take a bath this morning?" <laughs> and oh yeah, that kind of thing, the dialogue. And uh, so Bonnie said something smart as to him, something like, "Yes, I did, sir, but did you?" Or something like that. <laughs> and he came back at it, you know. And uh, those are good memories for you know, all those little kids. We were, we were well respected. Dodie was a cheerleader at the at school, and we went to every damn cheerleading push. <laughs> Never missed every little league game, every swimming meet. Oh, the Olympics was a big one. I mean, my Olympics, 1948, uh, when I made the team and uh, um, didn't make the finals, but I got the, made the team. And the fact that I was an Olympic, in fact, I wore an Olympic ring, you know, and. Uh, that was a, a pretty high stuff, yeah. but I was never prepared for that, those big achievements. I always liked that. I didn't really fit. You know, I, I really didn't. I wouldn't say deserve it, but I'm embarrassed that I was singled out ahead of time. And I had this, this dream about my funeral. I am not getting a military funeral. I'm not having a mass. I'm not having a eulogy. I'm not having anything. They're gonna burn me up, put me in a cardboard box, fly me to Hawaii, drop me off the reef. You know. And Timmy's gonna, and my buddy from West Point, I'm gonna paddle out and just plunk. And not scatter, but just plunk. <laughs> so that the kids have a place that they can go see, yeah, dad's out there someplace, you know. There's a particular place we all search off of 
well, you know, Makapu Beach. And uh, so, you know, it's all got to come to an end promptly. You're in a process, you're born and you go through the, the difficulty of your early life, but you continue on this train. And I'm coming to the end of my train. And uh, it's going to end right, because I've lived right. And there's some things I, I really, really regret. I all of it smacked my wife once in a fit of anger. And uh, I can never undo that. But I, d I don't try to hide it. I am not going to hide it. People are usually surprised. But if you met her, you wouldn't be surprised. <laughs> Should have hit her twice. <laughs> Got in a lot of trouble with that one, boy. Uh, but you do things. You got a little motor inside of you that's running, you know, it's got a, th you got a throttle and, and somehow you're not in control of, the, you're not always in control of the throttle. I, I loved the Army. I loved what I was doing. I was excited all the time. Um, while I had a lot of difficulties, they were generally something that I had absolutely no control over. I, can't, I had one, one commanding officer, oh, here's one, I had a close friend who was Jewish. We both got assigned this to what they call SCARWAF. It's Army Forces serving the Air Force in security sense. And we, we had uh, oh, maybe 20 soldiers. This is in Korea. And uh, this guy's name was, uh, <laughs> what kind of, Abr Abrams. Morris Abrams. And uh, I think I was a captain, or maybe a book first class. Anyway, we had the duty of securing this base. And uh, we got a quantity given to us, and we made it into kind of a barracks, you know, uh, fix it up. And we go over to the club, and they made a little, another little club out of Quonset, which is right next to us. And uh, we'd have dinner, and his table manners were terrible. God, he was awful. Um, I mean, awful. So the old man, an Air Force colonel, called me in and said, you are him. <laughs> you get him straightened out by dinner tonight, and uh, if you can't, then he doesn't eat, and neither do you. So the Air Force guy was really laying it on me. I don't know if he's kidding or not, but I didn't know. Yeah, so I pulled him aside and I said, "Hey, the boss says I've got a problem, and uh, I'm saying you clean up your act. You have better table manners, and I'll teach you how to do it if necessary. Well, you're just being anti-Semitic. You know that's like." I said, what's my last name? He said, it's Wallach, isn't it? Wallach, W-A-L-L. Ever hear of a, a Jew by the name of Wallach? There are lots of Wallachs that are Jews. So if I'm anti-Semitic, you're the Pope. Do it by tonight. <laughs> so, you know, I was a little ashamed that the guy would accuse me of being anti-Semitic, but he's just mad. You know? Years later, we met again, and he was now my senior officer. And uh, I thought, God, here it comes. I'm going to get it. Uh, he, 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 he said to me that you know it's the best thing that ever happened to him. I don't know if he, he believes it or not, but that was one of those little unique experiences you go through. I knew a guy that got fragged, and uh, I've kept silent about it all these years because I'm too afraid to be an accessory to the, to the damn thing. Um, but I, I really regret even it being. I was always was aware it was going to happen. I could have headed it off. You know, I'm an, I'm an NCO. At, at, at my mind is an NCO. My body is a, a West Point <laughs> cadet. Uh, my rank is, uh, you know, senior officer. But the truth of the matter is, I'm a very mixed bag. It's something I have never really figured it out. I just know that Diana and I got a good thing going, <laughs> and if I can just keep my wits about me with this military stuff and not get pissed off so often. Uh, I had a little niche down here that I was carving out for myself, you know, and I wanted it to go on. But it wasn't going anywhere because the people I was dealing with just, they just didn't have it. Like the special ops thing, you know, that's a, a new thing. And with the arrival of civil affairs in special ops, causing special ops to expand, special ops became popular up before that time. Special Forces guys, you kiss, you kiss goodbye. We're going to get promoted. So now we got a new thing. And Bill Burkham was the reason that happened. 
And Bill Berkman said of me to somebody else later on that I was the best civil affairs officer he ever knew. So I went, went to him and I said, I understand you said this. And I said, God damn it, Bill, don't you understand I'm an infantry officer? <laughs> so anyway, I was calling a three-star general, <laughs> Bill. There's still a niche out there for me. I'm a, I love giving speeches, good speeches, because I work hard on them. Um, but there's a niche yet to be found. I'm not sure where it is. The thing that you and I went to were easy words and um, now who was that gal that ran the, the tall Filipina that runs oh, the clinic? Oh, that was Jenny Batang Malake. Jenny Batang Malake, Dr. Batang Malake. No, that, not that, not, this one is not a doctor. She's a good looking, tall, slender Filipina. She, she brought a bunch of Filipino guys there. She works at the clinic. I think that would have been Jenny, wasn't it? Uh, she good looking? Uh -huh. But she's not slender. No, this one is good. <laughs> this, is, this is a beauty. Uh, I'll see about it with yeah. I'm not for sure. How is, is that still continuing at all? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're having the, the um, uh, black and white ball of Philippine issue at the end of July. Yeah. Down at, um, I think, the Hyatt down by the airport. Mm -hmm. uh, in July, the uh, formal affairs mm -hmm. uh, celebrating the independence of Philippines. That's right. They'll be doing exhibit in the film and stuff like that. Yeah. So, I think we finished the film, otherwise, it's just an exhibit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> she was driven to and from Mars then. <laughs> I'm not that distant. I'm just. Like, <laughs> well, we never had a chance yeah. to talk to her. Just the son of a bitch. That's all. <laughs> well, I think everybody is certain yeah. under circumstances. Yeah. And, and, and we've had a. Uh, because, you know, with the military museum, our whole effort is to try and, and bring real people stories in a way that um, provides stimulation, provide um, information, provide realism mm -hmm. to what real, what real history is. Covering the military life, uh, I think did very well for us to share that mm -hmm. because it is a unique life, mm -hmm. very different than anything in the world, really, mm -hmm. uh, especially the American military. It's very different. Mm -hmm. uh, the Brits come close, but not anywhere near. The <laughs> <laughs> Brits, I love the Brits. <laughs> uh, you know, but they're about the closest ones, maybe the Germans, but they don't have any of that stuff we do. Mm -hmm. uh, judgment is about all they have. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's there's uh, some real unique things. Mm -hmm. sure that we get this out <laughs> and how we're going to do that because there's unique stories here and I, and I wanted to thank you on that because this is really a, a unique story for us. Let me show you something that I'm going to give to you, not right away because I have to get the children off the, off the, the gift list and uh, come on upstairs. Medal from Vietnam, as is this and this. This is the honor medal for officers. This is the uh, civic action or civil action. And this is the campaign that these are Vietnam issued. This is a World War II victory. This is a special medal awarded to civilian service in Vietnam. And this is, uh, surprisingly enough, the California Medal of Merit. Okay, we'll this is the uh, <coughs> Vietnamese. Army uh, Cross of Valor, or Valor, yeah, Cross of Valor. This is a special caste medal for the commemoration of the American and Korean veterans uh, of the war, combat veterans. United Nations Medal awarded for in service to the United Nations in Korea. Oops, this is the American Campaign Medal uh, from World War II. This is the uh, California National Guard. Uh, 
accommodation medal, and it's got an interesting title. It says, Bringing in, bringing them to match your mountains. And this is, believe it or not, the California National Guard Good Conduct Medal. This is the Military Service Medal, uh, American Army awarded three times. This is the Army Commendation Medal awarded twice, uh, three times. Army Good Conduct Medal, which is missing its second uh, award. Asiatic Pacific Medal, Asiatic Pacific Campaign Medal for during World War II. This is the Vietnamese Campaign Medal, and this is the Korean Service Medal. And this is the Reserve Component Achievement Medal. This is the Expeditionary Force Medal. This is an unusual award. This is a uh, the military order of the world wars, and each one of these uh, uh, attachments indicates some level of achievement. Um, this is, let's see, <laughs> I've forgotten this one. Uh, this is the uh, Reserve Component uh, uh, Service Medal. This is Humanitarian Service Medal. That's what you mean, I got that right. That's, that's the National Defense. This is the Expeditionary Medal. Yeah, Armed Force Expeditionary. Mm -hmm. Got it. <laughs> All right, this is the, um, let me think for a second. Army Achievement Medal, Bronze Star Medal, Army of Occupation of Japan, World War II, Philippine Liberation Medal, World War II, um, Korean War Service Medal issued by the Korean government and the uh, American Purple Heart, Purple Heart Medal. Uh, you need a couple of LCs on that too, right? Yeah, but I, I never, uh, there are attachments that I haven't put on yet. And, uh, that's a very interesting one. This is a kind of a collection, potpourri, combat infantry badge, senior par American parachutist badge, Pathfinder badge, Philippine senior parachute badge, um, parachute riggers badge. This is a symbol of the rank of a colonel. This is the glider badge. You don't see that anymore. This is United Nations partisan forces in Korea. These are behind the line guys. This is the Japanese Special Forces Badge. This is Special Operations Command, 511 Parachute Infantry Regimental Crest, Civil Affairs Regimental Crest, and these two are the, the uh, 159th Infantry insignia for a distinguished member of the regiment. This is an aide-de-camp uh, uh, insignia for a three-star general. And this is a 351st Civil Affairs Medal. Uh, this is the uh, this is the organization that began the involvement in the Special Operations Command. And he coasted the rest of the war. Well, two by two guys, and they're really tough. <laughs> the next project after the, that the ex commissary is. Sure, of course. That's right. That's a well, delightful place. We just got back from. Um, uh, our, Previous trip was to Molokai. To the I found it in National Geographic. It doesn't make any difference. Mm -hmm. uh, I just said there's a cat sitting at the top of the stairs, and those flowers in the pot, so typical of my mother. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And the Zori. And, and the Zori. Everybody's Zori's, yeah. Oh, go ahead, yeah. And the beat up stairs. And mm -hmm. Well, with the rain. Yeah. I mean, Sam Brown Bell. I wears, oh, pink, okay. wears pink and greens. Yeah. I love those. And, uh, and his arms were just um, a tick. Okay. Yeah. Okay, you're doing this one here. That's why it was the first one. Take a look and see what, you say, what he says. Yeah. Very nice. They have good eyes, though. Yeah. Yeah. I'd like to uh, welcome you on behalf of the California Military, California State Military Museum, 
and the California Military History Educational Project. Uh, and today we're at the home of Colonel Leonard Wallach uh, at his home in West Hills, California. And today is the 24th of June, uh, 2003. It's about uh, 20 to 11 uh, Tuesday morning. And so first I'd like to welcome you, Colonel Wallach. Thank you. And, uh, Thank you. Have a chance to. Uh, you're welcoming to my own home. <laughs> yeah, well, welcome to your own home, but welcome for the opportunity to interview you today. Uh, and one of the things that
uh, we're interviewing um, Colonel Leon Wallach, and it's uh, June 24th, uh, Tuesday, uh, and we're take three. Uh, Colonel, we were we were just kind of focusing on your writing mm -hmm. and how that has been kind of a second and third or maybe a fourth career for you. Uh, <laughs> I didn't know. It's cool, okay. Uh, and, and how how has that manifested itself now? You've been retired for what, thir you know, 15, 16 years. Mm -hmm. uh, that's become a more important part of your life now. Tell me about how that's done. Well, you know, it's easy to be smug about your ability, and it's dangerous for me to say I'm good, I'm damn good. Uh, so I got to get somewhere in between that being smug and and uh, being real, realistic for my answer. Um, I didn't ask God or whoever created me to be smart or to be creative. It just happened, you know. And I'm blessed that I do have that gift. And again, I can't take credit for it, but I can be its custodian. And I have a responsibility to take that talent and to use it wisely and as, as solidly as I can focus it on where I should go with it or it should, it, it should go with me. It's saying that, um, I have the ability to think. Um, I know the, I know the, the method of thinking, and I use that, and I muse over what I should be doing with that talent. What should I write about? Now, I can be a very cute writer and be clever, and lots of people are clever, and that's kind of artificial, but people do read that stuff, and I could then write cleverly uh, and uh, make money at it, and most of the war novels and you know the kind of people I'm talking about, especially those who writing, continue writing the same kind of trash. That's okay, I mean, but I don't have to do that. I could pick something more serious because I tend to be on the serious side of things. Or I can go philosophical, and you know the kind of stuff that comes out of that. It gets so profound that only the writer knows what he's talking about. <laughs> so I had to, had to search out what I what I wanted. Right now, my interest has been for several years. I'm very much interested in the military history of the Philippines and the military history of Hawaii. And I'm not talking about the cowboys and Indians now. I'm talking about uh, the uh, the, the lead-up groups, like the Negritos in the Philippines. The episode of Magellan and Lafu Lafu, um, the, going back and something like, um, I heard that there were 300,000 warriors in the Philippines um, before 1898 when the Spanish-American War turned. So I have, a, I have an interest historically in that. Now within, the, within all that, there are some characters that uh, interests me. Aguinaldo is one. Um, Bonifacio is another one. Aguinaldo inter interests me because he's somewhere between a crook and a general. I'm not sure where, but uh, the more I read about it, the more controversial the guy is. And yet he he's, uh, would make a very, very good subject to expand on. I went to the Philippine bookstore a few days ago trying to find something to meet in it. Well, there's nothing, there's nothing there, you know? I got a history of the Philippine Islands, and, uh, uh, and there's hardly nothing there. I, I got another little book on the, the list of the prominent Filipinos. He's really worth two paragraphs. So I have a, almost a compulsion. I want to dig on this guy a little more, you know? And, because uh, I think probably, he, maybe he's, I think he's a rascal, but I'm not sure, but certainly he's worthy of a full-blown biography. On the Philippine sun on the flag, there are eight rays, and they represent the, the, uh, the communities that rose up against the Spanish. Um, and if you read about that, you get this 
view that all Filipinos were heroes, all George Washington, just like in, in, in World War II, all the Filipinos were guerrillas, you know. I don't think that's true. I think probably there's somewhere there's a lot of distortions, and it, and it deserves to be faced with the truth. It's like talking about General MacArthur. My feeling about him is not very popular, but yet he is adored in the Philippines. So why? The Philippine personality is such that they have to have a hero? Um, so that's one area that I'm particularly interested in right now. Um, I'm also now trying to find something in sports literature, something could be sports literature, that talks more wisely and intelligently about the spirit of activity. Um, Tom Fatko is a professor down at San Jose State, and he writes about uh, sports psychology. Everybody's writing about sports psychology, and particularly him, but that's not what I'm interested in. I'm to, there's something that goes on with an athlete like that uh, uh, is unique and different and has not been articulated properly. Billy Mills, a great American 10,000 meter runner, Indian Marine Corps guy, is a friend of mine. and. Uh, we went running one time, matter of fact, from the Belmont Hills, and uh, we're running along. I, I, I dog along maybe at, in those days about a 7:30 pace, and Billy could probably knock off a four or ten pace. Anyway, we're running along, and it's sun, sunset, the fog's coming in, and uh, on this trail, and we're just BSing back and forth, and things got kind of quiet. We were out there pretty far. It was getting cold. I had no shirt on, and uh, we're gonna turn around and go back. And so I said, let's just stop for a second. So we did, and he said, Len, you know, there's a legend that the Indian will lead the white man to civilization. And I said, Billy, you're going right over my head. What are you talking about? And he says, and he pointed to the fog and the trees, and he said, this is civilization. I thought, damn it, why couldn't I have thought that? Why couldn't I have created that, that thought in my brain? What is it that I'm missing? And of course, the next question is, what is everybody else missing? Why is it that we worship at the troth of uh, Muhammad Ali over this pathetic, this pathetic Indian and tolerate a guy like George Foreman? What is it that, that's there? So it's, it's that spiritual part of sport. And I've coined a phrase often that sport um, replicates man's struggle against adversity. Man's struggle against adversity. Well, in a kind of a safe way it does, but I've been on runs of 100 miles or so, and I'll tell you, it ain't, it ain't, it ain't safe doing that. <laughs> so what is it that drives a guy like me, a little old me, I'm a skinny little shrimp, to do that kind of stuff? What is the spiritual quality of sport? Um, it's not heroics, because that anybody can do that. Anybody can do that. There's something more, like a little kid running on a playground in a 100-yard dash against his classmate. What's going on there? It, uh, so I need to spend a little more time thinking about that. I'm sure I'll come up with something, but that's the kind of area I'd like to write. Unfortunately, that, that's a Reader's Digest type thing. You know, it's not long enough, and it's certainly not challenging enough. Um, I love the historical aspects of stuff. Uh, that consumes a lot of time in the writing part. Maybe where you can really flesh it out. And I've got a couple, couple of good ones that I'm almost finished with. One is the origins of marathoning in North America. It's a full-blown piece. It took me two years to write it, and I've been sitting on my desk for two years. Why haven't I been willing to put it out? I simply was not ready uh, to lay this beautiful piece on the, in front of slobs. This is the way I am. You know. That doesn't mean I'm vain now, please don't misunderstand. It's not vanity, it's just a practical manner of facing who I am. And so you're now you uh, look, uh, there's a special ops. Yeah. There you go. Uh, we're after a break and we, we, uh, we're continuing the uh, interview. Uh, when, as a career army officer for 40 some years, and you had many opportunities and many opportunities and be successful someplace else, or have other challenges. Why would the diverse background skills, would you stay in the military? Why would uh, that have provided you satisfaction? 
cowboys and Indians. <laughs> no, I think probably uh, somewhere in my life, uh, I must have been exposed to and accepted the idea that the military is a noble profession and that I was setting myself aside. In fact, I know that it is a noble. And I, pursuing noble purpose is one of the, one of the lines in the, um, the, the Army Regulations on Decorations and Award uh, given for a pursuit of noble purpose. So I must have had something happen, uh, kind of a, not a transition, but a, a osmosis, I guess where the thought that what I was doing was so worthwhile that I should continue in spite of all the difficulties. And there were lots and lots of times when I wanted to say, kiss my ass, Uncle Sam. Um, the, uh, most of the injustices that happened to me and my other friends were, are man-made. I mean, God didn't strike me. <laughs> uh, the, uh, there I had a couple of really nasty situations where I got a where I really got into personalities that were terrible. But <clears throat> I guess I clung to automatically without even being aware of it, that uh, it was noble. And, you know, when you're an army kid growing up, you are surrounded with stories about the past and these great heroes, and, and you start reading, and, you know, and of course I started reading all the good stuff, <laughs> you know, like, like uh, the, uh, well, not, not that, but the biographies of some of the early people, and probably got inspired. Like, wow, General Peyton March, he's the chief of staff, man, wow, wow. <laughs> and uh, our Joe Swing's family goes back to the pre-revolutionary war. Hmm, I gotta do that. <laughs> and uh, yeah, you know, when I go to the, these award ceremonies and the daughters of the American Revolution come up with their medals and craft the guide, how pitiful this is. Where is their pride? That may be another reason, just proud. I like being, like, like looking the part. It's terrible to say that the vanity drove me on. I want more medals. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, but that, that's it. I think it's a, it's a very um, interesting area to explore. Uh -huh. uh, because uh, it's why it's not just sitting in a jet plane and taking off a carrier. It's not just uh, uh, being the best shot. Mm -hmm. Being able to bark orders, or being a drill instructor, or being able to handle ski pit, mm -hmm. ski fights, there's, there's something more to it. Mm -hmm. um, is it camaraderie? Is it you know, what is it that's, that makes this um, at least the American military very unique from other militaries in the world? And, and, and that's uh, I've seen a lot of them, and I've never been able to find anything that looks anywhere near ours. Yeah, I suppose so. You know, we're the only nation, only country that has a written document, constitution, and the Declaration of Independence that were well thought out and that have survived. Even the Magna Carta doesn't get anywhere near us. And so that's starting with that, the kids grow up with that idea that we're unique. And of course the military has always been, everybody's enamored by the uniforms. And when you're a kid growing up, you play cops and robbers. And, and so you, when you get, into it like that, eventually you're going to come to the point that you've got to do some real thinking about what is this all about, you know? And what am I doing with my life? Is this something that I, w I don't want to go to jump, don't want to go to jump school or glider school? Or I want to go to CBR? To, you know, what are the things, opportunities that are being offered me? And then what are the difficulties in the way? Um, I think probably it's kind of a combination of flash and dash. That is, you, you look at all that stuff and say, boy, I want to be one of those guys. You know? I want to be a hero. And you don't know what this, you have the slightest idea what that means, you know? but you want to do it. You know, the, the thing that's going on now, everybody's got a medal for something. <laughs> and uh, the, uh, it's like the, the confidentiality badge is a big thing in the military. And of course, everybody wants to get it. And now all of a sudden we've got a bunch of 19-year-old kids that got the combat infantry badge for doing what? Is that equivalent to the combat infantry badge of World War II? I don't know, but you know they want it. So they get caught up now, can they sustain it? I don't think I've ever had a period in my military career that was boring. That take one, one period that was boring. Kind of like everything was fun, you know? Even when it got hard. <laughs> and, but, uh, 
but there are times in my life I thought, this is crazy. I'm out here pulling targets, you know, in the, in the cold and rain in Fort Ord. <laughs> what am I doing here, you know? This is not the army I, I joined. But I still get hooked on the parades and, and more than decorations. I've been known to be go overboard on ceremonies. Um, I mean, I, I, I just can't go to a dinner party without giving a speech. You know? <laughs> but uh, I guess it's, it's, a, it's a structured way of life where you know how the outcome's going to be. In civilian life, I have not found a single thing where you get the respect, the comfort, the prestige of being a soldier. And when you go in civilian life and you are acting out your part as, as a soldier, even there you don't get anything. I mean, I, just, I find it crazy that people have no idea. I sit down and they start calling me Sarge, you know, it's just a joke, you know. And I, but of course, I don't let that happen. If you try that with me, you find out real quickly who I am. You know? um, the, uh, but in the military, it's all, it, the very first lesson you learn in the military, the very first course you get is military courtesy, right? And so you, you, you're growing up in an atmosphere where everything's so structured, even how to say sir, you know? And they don't require you to salute without you knowing what you're doing. And it's that, that uh, it's elevated man's behavior to a very high level, I think. Um, of course, I have the good fortune of coming out of a tradition of being a fourth generation soldier where I have perhaps even a greater appreciation for it. And I see the failings my right and left. I particularly see it in the reserve components where, whew, wow, <laughs> they got a ways to go. We got a ways to go too in the regular center. Look at this thing at the Air Force Academy. I mean, how could that happen? How could they cover it up? They had to cut their ears off. You know, I, I, of course, I'm very fond of West Point. The other day, I decorated a kid that's uh, in the ROTC with the, special, with the Special Forces Medal, and that's big time, you know? And he was accepted at West Point, and he was leaving the next day. And that, why that gets pretty cool, you know? This kid, American high school kid, uh, got the Special Forces Medal and he's going to West Point. I mean, boy, there's something right about that, you know? And that particular school, Valencia High School, they really go all out on this military stuff. You gotta get away from form, and get to content. And one of the problems with the reserve components, they're preoccupied with, fo with form and not content. They talk about being soldiers, but they don't treat their soldiers like soldiers. I mean, your situation is difficult. Don't, don't, don't think I'm mad at the reserve components. I'm just making an observation. Mm. No, I, I think that that's a pretty much general health mm. concept that where uh, for some reason that seems to permeate those, uh, those two uh, areas. Uh, the last area I wanted to explore was uh, not only this new life you have, mm. but tell me about you, your family. Now, you, you had a number of children. Uh, you have a second family mm -hmm. and some stepchildren. Uh, it's a new life for you. What's, what's the last 11 years been like? <laughs> oh, I did. I've had a great time. I have had a great time. Um, well, the kids all have all done extraordinarily well, far beyond my expectation. And in each case, they did it by themselves. You know, my kids have never, never borrowed money from me. Nor have they ever called me sir. Interesting. There's, there's some kind of stuff in there I don't quite see. But, uh, Timmy, the FBI agent, is uh, um, right at the top of the heap, yet he was dyslexic. He had a tough time getting through the academy. Um, he had a tough time getting his master's in Hawaii. Um, Bonnie, in the Drug Enforcement Agency, is now married to. Uh, a guy in diplomatic corps who was in diplomatic security down in Honduras, just his second assignment. He was in the Philippines before. Um, both dangerous assignments. Um, Leah is a nutritionist. Uh, she got a fellowship at Stanford on death and dying. And uh, she's doing, she's, she's a little ill right now, but she's bright. She's a bright kid, got a real brain on her. Very conservative in her approach to nutrition. Diabetic, on top of it all. Um, 
that brings me down to um, well, Bonnie's uh, D DEA lady. Dodi is a school teacher. Matter of fact, she moved from Belmont, where she was at now down in Pasadena. Um, she has a daughter who is a college graduate who wants to go into into uh, acting. Whether or not she's going to be successful or not, who knows? But like the rest of the kids, they're going to they're all going to do it. Little Scotty uh, is up in Northern California. He's, a, he's kind of a self-made contractor. He likes being up there in the boondocks. Um, he's a, he's a he's step to step son. Oh, Jeff. Jeff had a hard time adjusting, and he, he was the most valuable athlete when he was going to Carmen and wrestling. Um, but now he seems to be getting on his feet and going right, right, right direction. He's a surfer. He's a good one. Um, but they're all surfers. <laughs> <laughs> but Wallach's not a surfer. Then uh, Diana's kids, Steve is a stockbroker type financial guy, and um, way up high in his firm. And he lives in Connecticut, and they're very wealthy, and they're, you know, they're just nice guys. Got uh, two kids, they're nice kids, and his wife is a sweetheart, just a sweetheart. Little kind of a girl from Indiana, you know, grew up in Indiana. He went to Notre Dame, not Notre Dame, California, Notre Dame, Notre Dame. Um, and Scott, the other Scott's out here in the coast, he's also in the financial thing, and uh, he's got three kids, and uh, they live in, in a very well-to-do thing. Uh, but you look at them, we don't, have to, we don't worry about them. You know, they're, they're good kids. We don't worry about them financially either. Uh, the, uh, that's a, a big boon, and we've got a, kind of an informal agreement. I don't particularly like traveling to the East. So when Diana wants to go there, go. I went last year with her and uh, froze my ass off for two weeks in Connecticut. God. <laughs> and they live in Greenwich, you know. And Greenwich is a real uppity town. I don't, I don't know just for. <laughs> I mean, I'd rather be down in Mexico in the tea water. I'm not more that kind of guy. Um, she's, we're going up north this coming weekend to, to run the Dipsy race, which is a 14-miler for Billy Goats, huh? and uh, we'll, we'll see the kids, and, uh, but just briefly. Well, how, how would your life remarry the young Shane? Oh, God. She, Diana is, a, is an angel. She's an angel. We, without ever even talking about it, we some kind of informal rules. For, for, yeah, we didn't, we, for, before we got married, we, we played it straight because there are children involved and their reputations involved. And, and uh, we both wanted to protect each other. That's, a, that's unusual in the modern marriage. Right? Um, a lot of unwritten stuff. Uh, we split the expenses right down the middle. Um, she keeps her bank account. I keep mine, but I keep my checkbook so she, so she can see it. I never ask questions about her past. She can ask me anything she wants. And, um, and she's good about that. The, uh, there's a high level of trust, very high level of trust. I was concerned that when we got married that she could, could maybe couldn't handle the Army traditions. You know? And uh, I mean, it's traditional, like get out of the car when the plane retreat. You know? <laughs> it's a minor little thing, but I, I wanted to be sure she had a good, solid respect for it. But she's fine. If she gets to the commissary, and if somebody waitress waits on her improperly, she nails it. And that's the way it should be. Um, she's very courteous to everybody in the military. But if an MP stops her and gives her gives her mouth, he's going to get it right back. You know? <laughs> so she's she's got walks that delicate line. Um, she with my military friends who are slobs, she lets them know real quick that they're slobs. You know? um, she doesn't tolerate any foolishness. Command Sergeant Major, every time he sees her, he goes, over, he's big, you know, he'll pick her up, you know, and carry her around, you know, and she's got that charisma with, this, with these people. Everybody's very respectful of her. Not because she's my wife, but he's just, that's, that's Diana. Um, my my long-distance running days are pretty much gone, so I escort her in the car on the bike where she does the, the long train miles, uh, encourage her to continue. Um, we, uh, I'm not a big cook anymore, but about twice a week I get in there and make Chinese fried rice or something like that that she loves. And 
uh, we don't, I don't eat that much, so she's easy to cook for me. I think, well, much like you had today. She understands. She understands. Um, I, if I sit her down and say, I want to talk to you about this award ceremony that's coming here. I want you there. <laughs> I, I don't want to go alone. And I see it for a moment. She's thinking, oh my God, another, another one of these days. <laughs> and she still go, still go. Um, she came here the other day, and I've got this one ceremony planned for her 50th anniversary, 50th OCS graduation. And she said, aren't you being a little bit too elaborate on this? And of course, my first re reaction is, none of your goddamn business what I'm doing. Uh, this is my show. And I, I said, no, I, I, we could do it the easy way. And it's damn general. It doesn't, he's getting kind of gun shy. Uh, and so I said, Diana, it has nothing to do with those people. It's me. It's just for me. I'm doing this for me. I want a nice ceremony for me. And we're going to do it this way. And maybe I'm being too sharp with you, but it's going to be that way anyway. So anyway, uh, and she could have got pissed off, or she might have been pissed off. I don't know. Uh, she never voiced it. Uh, so it, it's that compromise. She says, uh, I want to paint the house yellow. Like, I'm color my eye. <laughs> so, oh, that's a wonderful idea, even if I think it's lousy. <laughs> and uh, um, what was the other thing? Something came up. About, oh, yes, she wants to get a new toilet. And she's talked about that particular toilet a hundred times and tiled the floor. And this, uh, I thought to myself, okay, my job is to say, yes, that's a wonderful idea, Diana. And even though I'm not the least bit interested, I've got to show interest. You know? And if it gets out of hand and she's not showing interest, I'll tell her, show some interest. I'm, you know, I had to give a speech, a Memorial Day speech at the cemetery. And it's the second time they've invited me. And I have very strong feelings about people giving speeches at cemeteries. And it's, it's a great opportunity to, to relieve a lot of grief if you do it right. And so I worked on a speech for maybe two weeks, got it just right. You know. And as, as I thought, it was long, half an hour speech, but I knew from my writings that I could hit it on the head and hold their attention. Man, I had him crying. Because <laughs> the point was, how do you relieve the grief? You know, don't grieve about the situation. Take some pride in what your husband did or your son did. That that he's 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 immortal. He stepped off the battlefield and became immortal. Do you understand immortality? <laughs> you know, hammering away these people and uh, raising my voice. And uh, I thought to, my, thought to myself, gee, you know, this is such a gift I'm giving. It's not that I'm so good, but I know what to do about grief. Because my mother died in an army hospital. My father died from wounds in, in World War II from North Africa. My brother was killed in Belgium. And my little brother uh, died in childbirth. And my nephew, halfway through his life, was just died. And my sister dies in a... You know, somewhere. So I know a lot about grief, you know. A lot about grief. Um, so I... I want to communicate that. So I'm, I'm, I'm telling Diana this, this speech, and this is what I'm trying to do. And then I thought to myself, no, I'm not going to tell her what I want to do. I'm going to read it to her and see if she reacts. And she reacted the way I thought it was. And of course, I walk away from the cemetery thinking, man, I have done good. I have done something good. With the little talent that I have, I've still done something good. And that's my mission in life, to try to do something good. Looks simple, but that's my motto. Uh, you guys have a very good uh, team to permeate mm -hmm. the wall like mine. Yeah. If, if you were going to, uh, you know, as we're finishing up, I wanted to ask, when I asked you earlier, and I mentioned it earlier, you know, the highs and lows in our lives, mm -hmm. the highs and lows in our careers, and, and the many careers you have, you might have a lot of different highs, mm -hmm. and maybe some of the lows you've already referred to. What might some of those be that were things to you that were uh, the peaks and the valleys? I mean, the lows or the highs? <laughs> Both. Well, I always want to be a general, you know. Uh, and I hungered after that. I get always working towards it. But I got, I got, I got a, I antagonized a lot of people and will continue to antagonize a lot of people. And uh, in spite of the fact that I know you have to be gracious and kind, I, I wasn't going to acquiesce to their bullshit, you know. They either had to accept my worth and value and my brains are 
or tell me to kiss off and punish me. And they did. They, I got held up several times. Um, second thing, I, I wish I would have been able to have commanded a brigade or a battalion just to see what it felt like. <laughs> uh, I didn't get that chance, but that's not, 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 a, that's not a real low. Um, level of trust. I don't want to ever, ever be in a situation again where I was entrusted. And when somebody challenges, challenges me about my decorations and awards, you better be ready for a counterattack. I had a situation at the Rudy, Rudy Hernandez chapter where this one guy, I was wearing a, I was wearing my greens and the unit decorations, I wear nine. I know what word. Nine? No, ten, ten, nine, nine. And it's something like, in those days there were maybe ten. One of them I wasn't wearing. Okay? And this guy, and you know, you know this guy, uh, challenged me about how come you have nine? You know, there are only ten. And I thought, what's wrong with this guy? And uh, well, it turned out that I had a kind of said to him, you can't wear <coughs> a military green jacket cut off like an Eisenhower jacket. You can't do that. And you cannot wear federal buttons on a state uniform. And there is a ritual you go through in a burial ceremony that you absolutely have to adhere to it perfectly. There's no room for you know some of this crap. And I've been very blunt with him about that. I actually had to talk to the whole group. And I said, I, I hate sloppy um, manual of arms. Anyway, this guy challenged me. So I said something to the effect, well, it's like this. You and I will meet again and we'll discuss it. But in the meantime, you better be prepared to finish your course of action. And uh, so I said, uh, and so he tried to give me some shit. So I said, We'll just turn it over to the FBI. Okay. Well, of course, about and of course the guys in the, the chapter didn't come, to, did not come to my defense, and they should. have. That's about that business of loyalty. They're all playing it safe, and to me, including Rudy. That's when I knew he was really, really, really weak. So I did turn it over to the FBI, and within a week, the guy was had to apologize in public. I didn't ask him to apologize in public. He decided he better. You know, <laughs> we got that FBI stuff. And, and I did. I actually brought the FBI guy in and sat down with uh, Rudy and me and him. And I was disappointed that Rudy didn't, didn't rise to the occasion. I should have known better. Then in another meeting, this one guy got up in the middle of a conversation I was having. He said, did you, did you really earn all those? <laughs> I thought, what, what, what is this? This is crazy. That I let myself in for that thing. And I said, uh, well, about the same way you earned your bad conduct discharge. And I opened up the door, you know, and, and it was overkill, but he had it coming. <laughs> and I never saw him again after that. And uh, that happened. And again, those guys didn't come to my defense. And it was the third time, same situation. What the hell was it? Oh, I know. No, the only times about being challenged. I wanted to bring in Bill X line and one other guy, prominent person, as honorary members of the chapter. Um, what hell? Because they had done. Bill X line was the former president of the of the board. Anyway, and I wanted to vote. I, Every guy in this group that, that we were working with has all been decorated as a result of my going behind the scenes and pulling strings to get their, you know, DD D D two fourteen or no, I still got them what they wanted. And the one guy surprised me because after I got him the bronze star, <coughs> he wanted the bronze star V, and I, so I got the sergeant major saying, "Go tell this asshole, <laughs> he's lucky to get the bronze star." And I got it for merit, not for not for not for heroism. Uh, because the guy had technically earned it. He was in World War II, got the combat infantry badge, and he was entitled. It's an automatic thing. So all I had to do was simply update his thing, but I wasn't going to give him a V under any conditions. 
And the, so I thought that he would come to the rescue of all people after I got him as a bronze star. And he could, he, so anyway, they voted against bringing these guys in. And I said, that's for me. And I, I, I've said over and over again, I will not do another goddamn thing for you people unless you do something nice for somebody else. If you don't do something nice for somebody else, I won't help you. And uh, so I left. And so that would be some of the valley. What are some of the special peaks in your office? Oh boy, there's lots of them. Fifth jump, <laughs> get those wings, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. You mentioned about that now. Hmm? What does that really mean to you? Oh man, I'm afraid of heights. I'm definitely afraid of heights. I had to, you know, this old theory, if you fall off the horse, get back on. And it doesn't work that way. <laughs> You're still just as scared. So I was, I was frightened, very frightened at heights. And uh, I showed the picture of this one guy that we went, well, we went out one or, one or two together. And um, anyway, the first jump was, wasn't that difficult. And because uh, Richie, Richie was behind me kicking my ass anyway. so. But as, when, you, when you're coming down with a parachute, the ground comes up to you. You don't go down to the ground. It, it, it rushes up to you. I thought, man, that's cool. <laughs> and all of a sudden, I'm on the ground getting, and bouncing all over the place. <laughs> I should have paid attention to that instructor. You know, what else you got to tell me? So the second and third were a little rough. Fourth, I was afraid I was going to get killed. The fifth one, I finally got the wings. <laughs> and I never have to get in this damn bear plane again. Of course, they didn't know I could be assigned of an airborne unit. And, uh, so that was a big thrill, big, big thrill. Um, you, you know the old saying, you're either airborne or you shit. <laughs> the, the, the airborne fraternity is, is really quite good. Most people are not afraid of jumping. I am. That was a, one of the peaks. When I got commissioned, I am an officer and gentleman by act of Congress. I am a commissioned officer in the United States Army. And daddy, don't you ever forget it, because I am it. And. Uh, then, um, you ever hear of the Order of Chamori? Uh, I, was, I was given the Order of Chamori. Uh, and that was a big, very extraordinary, I didn't expect it. Mention what it is for people who don't know what it is. The Order of Chamori, the Chamori people are uh, primarily Guamanians. <coughs> and uh, they have, um, going back centuries, even before the Spanish, they developed uh, as, as all island, island countries developed their own orders of uh, awards, like the Order of Kralakau and whatever. Each, each island country has that. Well, this is the ancient order of Chamori, which goes back pre-government, when they would award, the, a warrior was called a Chamori, and that was the award, the, the verbal. And so for me, that was just, I thought, I got something unusual. <laughs> Where's the ribbon? <laughs> uh, then, uh, let's see, what was the, the uh, oh, when the Korean thing started uh, at the Korean uh, party. No, I wasn't Korean. Where the hell was that? Oh, Queen Sirikit of Thailand and, and King Bumipo uh, get, cited me. And they don't give out medals to foreigners, but they gave silver boxes. And so I got this silver box from the Queen. From the Queen, you know? I thought, man, this is, this is cool. This is really cool. I am being singled out by the Queen. <laughs> and uh, uh, Boomerful was, was very, very gracious. My Olympic introduction, um, got, got 4,000 people applauding me, you know? Stand up, and that was, very, very. It was, it's not, the, not so much the, the fact that we had ended it, we were successful, they're recognizing that I was the leader. Same with the Vader Breakers. Uh, when I was it, with it for seven years, I took it from failure to 125,000 people. That's the largest sporting event in the world. <laughs> and I did it. And I. It, I actually would run in the race myself. I came across it, came around the final finish line and saw the finish line and, and all those 125,000 people going through smoothly and getting their drinks and having a good time. And I did that. Nobody else knows it but me. I did it. I'm just another running face in it. But I pulled that off. And uh, so that was a high. Military wise, um, friends I've made, I've made some wonderful friends. General Berkman has, has always been a mentor. Kind man. 
he became the chief executive for the Reserve Policy Board, which is all services, had been the chief of the Army Reserve. Um, I had been his deputy when we were on active duty. Um, I got the, oh, you know, I got awarded the Japanese uh, Special Forces Wings, which is not too bad. <laughs> and uh, I got the Philippine, oh, I got the Philippine National Wings from, uh, what's his name, uh, himself, uh, Marcos. It got a lot of, a lot of uh, jewelry recognition that they could wear. And uh, I got caught up in it for a while. Oh, the, the big one, though, the big one, the giant one is, this is the giant one, Secretary of Army Award, Distinguished Member of the Regiment. And that, uh, I mean, you don't get any higher than that. If that's your unit saying you have arrived and the Secretary of the Army is awarding it, and the Secretary of the Army doesn't stick his finger up your ass very well. <laughs> so, uh, I guess and then my kids, I used to go to the office club with my kids in, on, in Japan, we were living in Japan after mass, you know, and we'd go in and I'd be at the uniform, I'd be here, and my wife, and then all these little ducklings behind me, you know, and we'd go to this table, which, which was always held for us, the biggest table of the club, and General White would come in, and uh, he'd make, this guy was a great general, a three-star, he'd come up and he'd say, uh, Look at Timmy. He said, "Timmy, did you brush your teeth this morning?" <laughs> and he finally get down to Bonnie, and Bonnie's a little little girl. He says, he says "Bonnie, did you take a bath this morning?" <laughs> and oh yeah, that guy said he did a dialogue. And uh, so Bonnie said something smart as to him, something like, "Yes, I did, sir, but did you?" Or something like that. <laughs> and he came back at it, you know. And uh, those are good memories for all those little kids. We were, we were well respected. Dodie was the cheerleader at the, our school, and we went to every damn cheerleading <laughs> Never missed every little league game, every swimming meet. Oh, the Olympics was a big one. I mean, my Olympics, 1948, uh, when I made the team. And uh, um, didn't make the finals, but I got the, made the team. And the fact that I was in the Olympic, in fact, I wore an Olympic ring, you know. And, uh, that was a, a pretty high stuff, yeah. But I was never prepared for that, those big achievements. I always liked that. I didn't really fit. You know, I, I really didn't, I wouldn't say deserve it, but I'm embarrassed that I was singled out ahead of time. And I had this, this dream about my funeral. I am not getting a military funeral. I'm not having a mass, I'm not having a eulogy, I'm not having anything. You know, burn me up, put me in a cardboard box, fly me to Hawaii, drop me off the reef. You know. And Timmy's gonna, and my buddy from West Point, I'm gonna paddle out and just plunk. And not scatter, but just plunk. <laughs> so that the kids have a place that they can go see. Yeah, Dad's out there someplace, you know. There's a particular place we all search off of. Well, you know, Makapu Beach. And uh, so, you know, it's all gotta come to an end promptly. You're in a process, you're born and you go through the, the difficulty of your early life, but you continue on this train. And I'm coming to the end of my train. And uh, it's going to end right, because I've lived right. And there's some things I, I really, really regret. I hold and smacked my wife once in a fit of anger. And uh, I can never undo that. But I'm d I don't try to hide it. I am not going to hide it. People are usually surprised. But if you marry, you would be surprised. <laughs> Should I hit her twice? <laughs> Got in a lot of trouble with that one, boy. Uh, but you do things. You got a little motor inside of you that's running. You know, it's got a th you got a throttle, and, and somehow you're not in control of. The, you're not always in control of the throttle. I I loved the army. I loved what I was doing. I was excited all the time. Um, while I had a lot of difficulties, they were generally something that I had absolutely no control over. I can't. I had one one commanding officer. Oh, here's one. I had a close friend who was Jewish, and we both got assigned to, to what they call SCARWAF. It's Army Forces serving the Air Force and security sites. And we, we had uh, awaiting 20 soldiers. This is in Korea. 
And uh, this guy's name was, uh, <laughs> okay, Abram, Abrams, Morris Abrams. And uh, I think I was a captain, maybe above personal status. Anyway, we had the duty of securing this base. And uh, we got a quantity given to us, and we made it into kind of a barracks, you know, uh, fix it up. And we go over to the club. They made a little, another little club out of Quonset, which is right next to us. And uh, we'd have dinner, and his table manners were terrible. God, he was awful. Um, I mean, awful. So the old man, an Air Force colonel, called me in and said, you are him. <laughs> you get a friend out by dinner tonight. And uh, if you can't, then he doesn't eat. And neither do you. So the Air Force guy was very laying it on me. I don't know if he's kidding or not, but I didn't know. Yeah. So I pulled him aside and I said, hey, the boss says, I've got a problem. And uh, I'm saying you come up your act. You have better table manners. And I'll teach you how to do it if necessary. Well, you're just being anti-Semitic. You know, that's like, I said, what's my last name? <laughs> he said, it's Wallach, isn't it? Wallach, W-A-L-L. Ever hear of a, a Jew by the name of Wallach? There are lots of Wallachs that are Jews. So if I'm anti-Semitic, you're the Pope. Do it by tonight. <laughs> so, you know, I was a little ashamed that the guy would accuse me of being anti-Semitic, but he's just mad, you know. Years later, we met again, and he was now my senior officer. And uh, I thought, God, here it comes. I'm going to get it. Uh, he, 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 he said to me that you know it was the best thing that ever happened to him. I don't know if he, he believes it or not, but that was one of those little unique experiences you go through. I knew a guy that got fragged, and uh, I've kept silent about it all these years because I'm too afraid to be an accessory to the, to the damn thing. Um, but I, I really regret. Even being, I was always was aware it was going to happen. I could have headed it off. You know, I'm an I'm an NCO. At, at, at my mind is an NCO. My body is a, a West Point <laughs> cadet. Uh, my rank is uh, you know senior officer. But the truth of the matter is, I'm a very mixed bag. It's something I have never really figured it out. I just know that Diana and I got a good thing going, <laughs> and if I can just keep my wits about me with this military stuff and not get pissed off so often. Uh, I had a little niche down here that I was carving out for myself, you know, and I wanted it to go on, but it wasn't going anywhere because the people I was dealing with just, they just didn't have it. Like the special ops thing, you know, uh, that's a, a new thing, and with the arrival of civil affairs in special ops, causing special ops to expand, special ops became popular. Up before that time, special forces guys you could kiss, you could kiss goodbye. We're going to get promoted. So now we got a new thing, and Bill Berkman was the reason that happened. And Bill Berkman said of me to somebody else later on that I was the best civil affairs officer he ever knew. So I went, went to him and I said, "I understand you said this." I said, God damn it, Bill, don't you understand? I'm an infantry officer. <laughs> so, anyway, I was calling a three star general, <laughs> Bill. But there's still a niche out there for me. I'm a, I love giving speeches, good speeches, because I work hard on them. Um, but there's a niche yet to be found. I'm not sure where it is. The thing that you and I went to were easy wares and. Um, Who was that gal that ran the, the tall Filipina? That runs oh, the clinic? Oh, that was Jenny Batang Malake. Jenny Batang Malake, Dr. Batang Malake. No, that, not that, not, this one is not a doctor. She's a good looking, tall, slender Filipina. She, she brought a bunch of Filipino guys there. She works at the clinic. I think that would have been Jenny, wasn't it? Uh, she good looking? Mm -hmm. Attractive, but she's not slender. No, oh, this one's good looking. <laughs> It's a beauty. I'll see about it I'm not for sure. How is, is that still continuing at all? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're having the, the um, uh, black and white ball of Philippine issue at the end of July. Mm -hmm. Down at, um, I think the highest down by the airport. Mm -hmm. uh, in July, the uh, formal affair mm -hmm. uh, celebrating the independence of Philippines. That's right. 
I heard that they were going to keep going, otherwise it was going to be good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> she was driven to and from very soon. That's probably Jen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, probably Jen. She's tall, mm -hmm. uh, and we were raised in Bay Ridge, but she's a uh, very nice lady, very, very attractive fellow female. Uh, you know, one of the things that, that uh, Lynn, I wanted, you know, one thank you, you know, because this is just oh, a terrific, thank me. terrific opportunity to chat with you. I know you a lot better now. <laughs> I'm not that distant. I'm just. <laughs> well, we never had a chance to yeah. talk to you. This is some of us. It's all. <laughs> well, I think everybody is certain mm. under circumstances. Mm. And, and, and we've had a. Uh, because, you know, with the Military Museum, our whole effort is to try and, and bring real people stories in a way that um, provides stimulation, provides um, information, provides realism mm -hmm. to what real what real history is. Covering the military life, uh, I think you did very well for us to share that mm -hmm. because it is a unique life, mm -hmm. very different than anything in the world, really, mm -hmm. uh, especially the American military. It's very different. Mm -hmm. uh, the Brits come close, but not anywhere near. <laughs> the Brits, I love the Brits. <laughs> uh, you know, but they're about the closest ones, maybe the Germans, but they don't have any of that stuff mm -hmm. either. Mm -hmm. uh, regiment is about all they have. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's, there's uh, some real unique things. Mm -hmm. Some way we can make sure that we get this out, <laughs> and how we're going to do that because there's unique stories here, and I, and I wanted to thank you on that because this is really a, a unique story for us. Let me show you something that I'm going to give to you, not right away, because I have to get the children off the off the, the gift list. And uh, come on upstairs. Actually, I can't really see too much. this way. And the medal from Vietnam, as is this and this. This is the Honor Medal for officers. This is the uh, Civic Action or Civil Action. And this is the campaign that these are Vietnam issued. This is a World War II victory. This is a special medal awarded to civilian service in Vietnam. And this is, uh, surprisingly enough, the California Medal of Merit. <laughs> This is the uh, Vietnamese Army uh, Cross of Valor, or Valor, yeah, Cross of Valor. This is a special caste medal for the commemoration of the American and Korean veterans uh, of the war, combat veterans. United Nations Medal awarded for in service to the United Nations in Korea. Oops. This is the American Campaign Medal uh, from World War II. This is the uh, California National Guard uh, Accommodation Medal, and it's got an interesting title. It says, Bringing Them, Bringing Them to Match Your Mountains. And this is, believe it or not, the California National Guard Good Conduct Medal. Okay, I'll get this here. Okay. This is the Meritorious Service Medal, uh, American Army, awarded three times. This is the Army Combination Medal, awarded twice, uh, three times. Army Good Conduct Medal, which is missing its second uh, award. Asiatic Pacific Medal, Asiatic Pacific Campaign Medal for during World War II. This is the Vietnamese Campaign Medal, and this is the Korean Service Medal. And this is the Reserve Component Achievement Medal. This is the Expeditionary Force Medal. This is an unusual award. This is a uh, the Military Order of the World Wars, and each one of these uh, uh, attachments indicates some level of achievement. Um, this is, let's see, <laughs> I've forgotten this one. Uh, this is the uh, Reserve Component uh, Service Medal. This is the Humanitarian Service Medal. That's what you mean, I got that right. That's, that's the National Defense. This is the Expeditionary Medal. Yeah, Armed Force Expeditionary. Mm -hmm. Got it. Screwed up. <laughs> All right, this is the, um, let me think for a second. 
Army Achievement Medal, Bronze Star Medal, Army of Occupation of Japan, World War II, Philippine Liberation Medal, World War II, um, Korean War Service Medal issued by the Korean government, and the uh, American Purple Heart, Purple Heart Medal. Uh, you need a couple of LCs on that too, right? Yeah, but I, I never put There are attachments that I haven't put on yet. So. That's a very interesting one. This is a kind of a collection, potpourri, combat infantry badge, senior per American parachutist badge, pathfinder badge, Philippine senior parachute badge, um, parachute riggers badge. This is a symbol of the rank of a colonel. This is the glider badge. You don't see that anymore. This is United Nations partisan forces in Korea. These are behind the line guys. This is the Japanese Special Forces Badge. This is Special Operations Command, 511th Parachute Infantry Regimental Crest, Civil Affairs Regimental Crest, and these two are the, the uh, 159th Infantry Insignia for a distinguished member of the regiment. This is an aide-de-camp uh, uh, insignia for a three-star general. And this is a 351st Civil Affairs Medal. Uh, this is the uh, this is the organization that began the involvement in the Special Operations Command. Oh my God. Good. You know, I'm not, I'm not, kill some of the way that way. Uh, sorry.